Tom, welcome to the podcast, mate. How are you? Good, thank you. All good. Good, mate. Thanks for coming on, mate. We've obviously been talking about it for a while, so it's nice to finally meet you, mate, and have a conversation. Yeah, no, I'm excited to uh, talk about a few things, obviously, that we discussed on uh, uh, Instagram. So it should be a decent insight into what we're doing here and, and what we're trying to achieve in the UK. So, Yeah, amazing, mate. So, so let's start with that, then, mate. Tell us where your jiu-jitsu journey started and how you become the head of Atos Jiu-Jitsu in the UK. Yeah, so obviously I started just same as everybody else, like zero expectation, just start training at a, a local community center it was. I was training probably two nights a week, max, nothing crazy. Um, I ended up moving over to um, a Grace Barrow Academy locally um, for just so I could get a few more extra sessions. Um, and then it was there when I met my uh, initial coach, uh, Victor, at a training day um, for GB. I went over there. Uh, and then from there, like, I found a decent team, uh, very strong, like, uh, competitively. Um, and I just essentially just started my career full time. So I, I quit work, um, saved up a little bit of money, did some little bits and bobs on the sides, just keep that journey going. Obviously, I had a lot of uh, support from parents uh, at that time. Um, and I was just like fully immersed in it. And from there, I opened my own academy uh, back home, which is like ridiculously successful. Like I couldn't have imagined uh, how it went. Um, then obviously in recent times, um, you know, I never really would say that uh, I was thinking about leaving GB, but there was, you know, certainly some things that went on and there was certainly some things uh, behind closed doors um, that, you know, didn't really sit morally uh, right with me. And, you know, I actually had a conversation with um, my parents and my partner. And I said, like, you know, almost feel like, not like a fraud, but, you know, I say to my training partners, I say to my my uh, students every day, like, you know, you have to go through uncomfortable situations to grow. Uh, and I think I was putting off an uncomfortable decision and an uncomfortable transition away uh, through comfort, really. I was sitting there, I was, you know, happy, good membership base, like, you know, we had good infrastructure, GB are very good, like, commercially. Um, but, you know, there were certain decisions that were made and then that was really the kind of uh, the the straw that brought the camels back essentially that led me to the next decision. And uh, I've always had a great relationship with um, coaches around the world. Like I've always put myself out there, I've always visited academies. Um, and then obviously to bring Atos to the UK was a, was a huge plan of mine, um, just purely based on their competitive um, achievement, really. Um, you know, a lot of people have opinions on teams and, you know, unfortunately opinions are subjective, but, Facts don't lie, and Atos as a team, you know, across Gi and Nogi, in my opinion, are the best team in the world. Obviously, you've got new emerging talents, you've got B teams, you've got New Wave, uh, and they are incredible, of course, and I've trained at both of those, and especially New Wave. Um, but I just thought what sits with me morally and, and what works for us here in the UK and with the influence of Gi classes that we have, I just thought Atos is, like, literally the perfect fit and to have a chance to do something that's not been done before uh, it's something that always like motivates me and something that I've always wanted to do. Do you know what I mean? I, I don't really like copying somebody else's blueprint. I'd like, I would wanted to create my own and create our own history is what we call it and, and go from there. Hey guys, just letting you know that we recently launched our new Everyday Black Belt membership on Patreon. This gives you access to our exclusive community where together we decide what future guests we're going to have on the podcast and what questions we're going to ask them. You also get exclusive content as well as early ad-free access to all of our episodes. So if you love what we do, don't spend 10 years getting a black belt. For the price of a coffee a month, get one now. It helps us, it supports the channel, and it helps us bring you better guests. When you first started training, you said you obviously started like everybody else, just training a couple of times a week. What was the, uh, what was the kind of turning point for you Like when you decided to go from just being a hobbyist to, to then sort of doing it full time? Like what, what was the decision-making process around that? So weirdly at that time, like I'd always um, hung out and I've always been uh, going to, there was a local academy here called um, UTC, Ultimate Training Centre. Uh, and that was actually where Leon first started training when he was 16. It was where like Vaughn Lee had trained, he was in the UFC. So I was always around these like full-time guys and everyone was full-time for various reasons, right? Some people just had nothing else to do and, you know, I was just in the gym every day and I kind of had the pair, like the, the parent conversation uh, with my own like mom and dad. And I said, look, listen, I know it's a little bit different. You might not understand it, but this is essentially like my uh, university, right? I'm going to go 
I'm going to train, I'm going to learn a skill. It's not going to be anything normal. It's not going to be anything, you know, that you're going to show off to your, your own friends about me going to uni or anything. It's a bit off the wall. But I said, if you can give me three, four years, I know what I'm capable of doing. I'd had great results training twice, three times a week. I knew if I took my training to the next level and I found professors and training partners that were competitively, you know, um, up there at world level, uh, I knew I could do it. And I had great references uh, still to this day. One of my, my best friends uh, and uh, training partners through jiu-jitsu was Ollie, who um, has an academy in Barnsley. Um, I seen him do it at a young age with his dad, coaching in a community centre and then opening a school. Uh, and I just thought, why not? Why can't I do that? Do you know what I mean? I, you know, and I've always done things very authentically sometimes it rubs people up the wrong way some people you know some people love me some people hate me whatever but you know i am just myself and um i wanted to open a school back here where i grew up uh, it's literally five minutes away from the council estate that i grew up on i live two minutes away from the gym as you can tell i just you know yeah. walked down here because the internet weren't working at home uh and i'm just i'm in my area and i'm being me and and everyone knows me around here and um i think that's why we've been so successful in in that pursuit of a great academy because uh it's real it's organic do you know what i mean and I, I don't pretend i'm perfect by no means i'm not um but i'm trying my best to be as as good as i can be competitively and uh, as a man or whatever else you know you want to throw in there yeah yeah cool and did you have like an athletic background before you started jiu-jitsu or was that your first athletic endeavor no so um i was actually like incredibly overweight i was about 16 17 stone i had like man booze like big belly i was like fucking <laughs> I looked horrible, honestly, and the reason I say that is because there's so many kids that come to the academy or there's so many people that um, come to jiu-jitsu and they actually tell me first, they go, oh, you know, I'd love to do it, but I just want to get a little bit fitter first. And I say, and this is like the, the craziest thing I've ever heard. Like I said, this is me when I started. I showed them my photo on my phone. And I'm like, that's how I started jiu-jitsu and this is where I am now. You know what I mean? And uh, I think people want to do this like prerequisite work and it doesn't exist. Yeah. You've just got to jump in, immerse yourself in it and just go. I really think uh, it's just, it's not an, an intentional stalling tactic, but I think for a lot of people that get a little bit hesitant about doing jiu-jitsu, it's definitely uh, something they put in the way uh, is their physical condition. But I can tell you first hand, I was in shocking shape and, you know, I couldn't do two, three rounds back to back, but <laughs> now here we are, so. Yeah, well, you you got a whoop band, didn't you? And when we rolled for an hour, you, you burnt over a thousand calories, mate. And and yeah. where else can what else can you do doing that? That's so fun, and just you just forget about it, don't you? With that, is that there's no like the, the thing that I find difficult with going to the gym, and I still find difficult now, is like just being inside my own head. Like if I go for a run for an hour, I can talk myself out of it halfway through because I don't like obviously there is a benefit and I know the benefit now I've got that discipline but beforehand I'm just like what's the point it's so boring it's so whatever yeah. and you can't really see the value but when you do jiu-jitsu unfortunately like you can't stop halfway through the round somebody's trying to like kill you so they actually bring you along and they're your resistance yeah. uh, and they set the level and before you know it you've done an hour's rounds you go Jesus Christ I'm absolutely bad but like at no point could you think about quitting because you were thinking about you know your actual position and techniques or or you were just thinking about not dying so yeah <laughs> yeah and i think i think as well like that carries on doesn't it you can do that day in day out i think that's the beautiful thing about jiu-jitsu compared to a lot of other sports you can do jiu-jitsu you can roll pretty much for an hour a day and kind of be fine yeah i think that's a, i think that's a unique selling point it's definitely something that we you know when people sign up we always uh emphasize is that you know, I love other martial arts, I really do. Boxing, kickboxing, incredible uh, combat sports, they are. Um, but you can't train them at 100% every day. You know, you're going to get brain damage, you're going to get, you know, punch drunk. It's difficult. But really and truly, if you are, uh, if you dissolve your ego in jiu-jitsu, you can train as hard as you want every day. As long as you tap and as long as you, you know, uh, look after your body and look after your training partners, you can do this as much as you want. There is obviously freak injuries, little niggles, little knocks you're going to get a thousand percent. Um, but most catastrophic injuries probably can be avoided if you know you just let positions go and you know you allow the takedown instead of going crazy and landing funny so <laughs> yeah very true mate and then you mentioned that you did all right sort of competitively sort of in those those first few years of training and then obviously an hour black bow and and where you are with jiu-jitsu i mean for for somebody who was obviously a bit overweight who didn't have an athletic background like what was the key to your success in those sort of first few years like how did you where did you find the the kind of motivation and the determination to to do well from 
So, I, even though I've been massively out of shape, I've always had like a quite a strong mindset. Like, that's probably what, like, if you meet somebody that knows me, like, that's how I am. Like, if I put my mind to something, uh, the class just finished. Uh, if I put my mind to something, I'm, I'm going to do it. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, there's nothing really, uh, and I say this all the time, people, you know, think I'm deluded or whatever, but I say, like, genuinely, there's nothing in the world now that I feel like I can't do because of the confidence jiu-jitsu gave me, do you know what I mean? Like, I've gone from being overweight, you know, out of shape to being a, a world medalist. I've, like, medaled at the highest level of competition three, four times. Uh, I've got pan silvers at black, but, like, I've done all these incredible achievements that when I speak about them, they don't even feel like myself. And then I sit there and I go, well, if I can do that in jiu-jitsu in 10 years or nine years, however long I've trained, there's nothing else in the world that if I don't put nine years in, I won't be the best at. And okay, I'm not world champion yet and I'm not number one yet, but I feel like I will be and I will, before my career ends, I will get a world title, probably no gi, definitely not in the gi. But uh, <laughs> and then, you know, I feel like that confidence that it gives you, the same in business, the same in like property, the same in anything I'm doing, I just feel like that I can't not do it. Do you know what I mean? Yes, there's going to be tough days and I have to learn things and I have to process things, but that's what I did all the way up to this point in jiu-jitsu. So um, it, it gives you a mass, massive confidence boost. It really does. Um, and that little bit of positive reinforcement at the beginning, you know, you, you train a little bit, you go compete. Oh, man, I got a medal or I beat a guy, lost to, to a guy, but you're just getting those little drip-fed, little bits of positive reinforcement. And you go, man, I'm starting to make moves. And then as soon as you get into that streak of, confidence like uh, my second year at blue belt first year at purple I, I truly like genuinely believe I was probably one of the best purple belts and blue belts in the world like I didn't I don't think anyone would beat me ever um <clears throat> and I've only lost the world champion since so um yeah uh, it gives you a lot of confidence and you can use that to go a long way so yeah, it certainly does, mate. And then obviously you mentioned that there were a few things with GB that you didn't align with, obviously, what you wanted to achieve. Are you able to talk yeah, about here that? Come the, here come the juicy sound bites now. Here come the little <laughs> juicy. Uh, no, so honestly, um, I'll be completely honest. I never felt uh, fully supported. I'll be completely transparent. Um, I don't have any personal vendettas against anybody. I, I truly wish them all um, the greatest of success, right? They're commercially and um business wise like so strong they really are um and credit to them they've got great systems in place and they do very well but um i just felt personally i was never supported uh to the fullest how i would support my members and how i support my students and people under me you know i think wrapping your arm around somebody sometimes goes a long way and trying to guide and um advise is is stronger than you know uh sanctions or trying to cause problems um, I also felt like I wasn't celebrated um, in terms of, you know, there's, there is no doubt um, and there's proof that can back it up from GB where with our spend there that we had the largest academy um, within the GB franchise. Uh, and I just felt like we had zero respect for it. We, we were never asked any questions. We were never, you know, I've gone to business conferences uh, as part of GB and I'm being led in a business conference by somebody that, you know, honestly can't run a business and you know as 50 members like i'm not being disrespectful but you know my dog could probably get 50 members at an academy so <laughs> i just didn't i just felt like it's uh completely off and if i'm honest um i think a lot of black belts in jiu-jitsu and i think a lot of people in jiu-jitsu and it's probably because of the confidence it gives you i think that they think that they uh are the be all and end all and can do everything uh, and i've always been very humble i've always been very honest that you need support in other areas. There's way better businessmen than me. There's way better salesmen than me. There's way better strategic business planners than me. And I've always tapped into that. I've always been very lucky and I've always found great people around me. But um, I just felt like uh, it's the same people in the room talking at the top, uh, regardless of actual achievement and whether it's actually on paper or not and whether it's legit or not. Uh, they were just there by default and there by position. Um, and if I'm completely honest, they're there by who they are, not what they've achieved and not what they mm -hmm. actually offer. Uh, and I felt it was a little bit, not I'm not going to say slow, but a little bit condescending. I felt I felt like I'm being talking to like a child, really. Uh, and they're talking about strategies and things that I've done that three years ago yeah. and it doesn't work. And this is, and I'm being honest, this is where we are. This is our membership base. What's everyone else's? 
Uh, and I'm not saying you should come into me begging me for advice because, like I said, I've, I've used great people around me um, and they've come up with great ideas. I've come up with great ideas, but I just felt there was never a mutual respect. Uh, and I think the issue with that, and I think where that's deep rooted is from like a professor to a student relationship. They always feel like more senior and, and more like they're in the, they should be guiding you. And, um, you know, I've got purple belt coaches here, blue belt coach downstairs right now, purple belt female coach. And I listen to their ideas and they come up with some incredible ideas and I would never try to own it as my own. Now, and I would never try to dismiss it because I'm a higher ranking Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Like, yes, I can choke you. But if you have a great idea, you have a great business plan, you have a really good strategy, I'm going to listen. Uh, and I just felt like that never actually happened within that organization. Um, and then obviously, like the, the the last kind of part of that was there was a uh, a new contract that came out, which changed pretty much the terms and conditions of how the business was run. So um, the easiest way to explain it, it was from like a license agreement to a franchise agreement. Um, and obviously a franchise agreement would make sense if the franchise had opened the academy and invested the funds. Um, but, you know, if you look behind me, every screw in this in this building, me and my dad put in, do you know what I mean? Like, we did this from scratch. We did it on shoestring budgets. We've reinvested every year. Uh, and for them to then essentially own what we've created uh, would have been heartbreaking. And obviously, the, there's all NDAs and things. You can't say this, you can't say that. There was many terms and conditions and for once reddit probably weren't that far off if you looked into it um, <laughs> yeah it was big uh, up rule one there everywhere from it there were some good predictions but listen you know i think right now it's like 33 or 35 out of 80 schools left um and that doesn't happen for no reason and that does that doesn't happen because tom's left and everyone's followed me I like i was the first to go and i know some people have said oh he's the catalyst and he knew this and that like i didn't know shit i just knew what the contract was i knew i didn't like it um, and I knew I wanted to get ahead of it because I felt like if I go last and some of the schools that are leaving now, you're a little bit behind. Um, and I just wanted to get things put in place. I wanted to have my conversations in America and San Diego with um, Andre and Angelica. And um, I was checked out. I was checked out probably six months before it even happened, if I'm honest. Um, but like I say, you're comfortable, you're, you're earning. And it's hard to make that business decision that puts everybody in jeopardy. But it's been nothing but positive And uh, we've just grew. Uh, ever since really yeah brilliant man what was the um i can i can imagine but what was the reaction like from people when you first like pulled the plug on it oh man <laughs> I, I, listen there was the craziest conspiracy theories ever and i'm a conspiracy theorist i love some conspiracy theories you know what i mean you want to send me some flat earth stuff i'm not a flat earther but um i was like man some people had just made up some absolute nonsense it was like uh tom's been kicked out because of this and that and things that had happened at events and whatever and i was like it makes no sense. Like this is a business game. We have over a thousand members here. Uh, you know, we were spending ridiculous amounts of money each year with GB wear to provide uniforms for our students. Um, you know, they even sent me from GB wear, uh, uh, statistics. Um, and we've, we've always been number one as a singular school. The person that was in second place owned five schools. So that's how successful we were as a business. Um, and then I'm still Crazy, the highest, I'm still in the top five highest spenders, uh, and I've been left for, for nearly a year. So um, <laughs> it just goes to show you like the level of the academy we had. And, you know, there's no secret now. People are trying to open academies locally and that's not just GB. There's loads of places trying to open and do what we've done. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, people in this area, they have a, they see through it. You know, they're, they're not cash cows uh, and they realize that it's unauthentic, right? You know, they've seen what we've done. And now they're trying to open here. It feels very much like you're trying to steal off the rich and give to the poor, right? And and that's and I'm being honest, that's the energy of everyone yeah. in this area that I've spoke to, and it's 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 well known. Um, so I wish all those academies the best of luck, but I don't think it I don't think it was the right timing for them, and I definitely don't think it was the right strategy, based off the back of what everyone had had seen and found out why people had left you know um and that's not just myself there's five other academies around here that are changed over to alento jj they all left too um and again if, if their game plan or their strategy is to just reopen those um schools under new management um i think it'll be a difficult difficult sell for them so we'll see yeah 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 where exactly are you based but i don't actually know 
Uh, so we're in Sutton Coldfield. Um, okay. We're in um, an area called uh, Mia Green. So it's a little bit north of the town centre. Um, it's like a very nice area, affluent area. Um, a lot of good schools around here, a lot of good people. And like I say, that's why it's so authentic to me because I lived on a council estate like five minutes away. And this to me was like the Beverly Hills, right? I, I don't joke. Like, <laughs> I had I had like a terrible um, school life, let's say. Um, and my mom always used to drive me through the, the roads around here. There's like some private um, roads, right, with some very nice houses on. And she said, listen, you can either be in these and get to this position or you'll be in like the police station. She used to drive past the police station. So um, it was a very motivating and inspiring area for me, honestly. Uh, and I used to look up to people that lived here. I used to go to school with some kids that lived in this area. And I was like, man, like that's where I, I want to be. That's where I want to put my own kids and, you know, God's plan I'm here and uh, I own a house five minutes away it's not uh, quite the ones I used to drive past but it will do and um, you know my kids are in them uh, in that area and going to them school so I did my job so um, but I think that's what people enjoy about it and that's why you know people gravitate towards us and our academy here we, you know I have a lot of coaches in a similar position that grew up around here live around here um, we know people well we know the area well most of the parents that are out there at the kids' class I went to school with. Um, so we're a very tight family, do you know what I mean? And um, that's why I say, like, there could be a thousand academies outside the door. We have absolutely zero concerns and we, we give everyone the, the best of luck and, you know, if they want any help, they know where we are. Yeah, mate, if you, can, if you can create that community, mate, it's massive, isn't it, I think? Yeah, I think that's the biggest part of it, honestly. It yeah. really is, like, people buy into that community. And you know what, it's important. You know, if I have a problem or I have an issue, I ask all the guys and, and vice versa. Like, it really is that special. And um, if I'm completely honest, since the transition and since we've moved, it's it's never felt more united and more connected. And, you know, as a business owner, in the in the first few years, right, your, your main concern and your main goal is like, man, we need to get members, we need to bring people in, we need more people in the classes, da 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 da. You got to build up, right? Um, and I think during that process, um, when you're like thirsty, unfortunately, like you can end up drinking like poisoned water, right? So there's been many people that have came in that are, you know, paying members, but they've never quite fit in terms of family and um you know obviously you lose some of those guys along the way and they find somewhere that fits them and that's absolutely amazing right because you know i introduced them to jiu-jitsu right i'll always have that that you know we were the reason why they they got involved and if they go off to another academy and have great success like you know wicked like i'm i'm so happy to see it i really am there's no animosity but um i think now we're at a mature stage where we have had a lot of, not a lot of people, but we've had a few people that have moved on or, uh, you know, kind of didn't fit the community and go elsewhere. And right now we, it's in its prime. Like we have a, a group that's like so united. Like we went to a Birmingham Open not long ago. There's like 400 people there from our school. Like the moms are there, the the kids are there, the parents are there like with um food and picnics and the kids are competing. We had like 162 competitors, won the team trophy like, no 162 problem. competitors that is wild yeah, yeah, yeah. that is actually fucking wild mate that, those numbers <laughs> are crazy yeah 162 what? but that's what we are you know we're just like a, a big family like that do you know what i mean and um yeah like i said i've never i've never felt more connected i've never felt more happy and you know if you genuinely ask people that come to the academy that don't even know me that well like even in my coaching and, and how i am around the place like there's definitely been an improvement in mood because you know, I did recognize it myself that I was getting a little bit low, like, you know, turning up to work and it did become a little bit too commercialized, a little bit too controlled for me. Like you've got to coach this, you've got to coach that, you need to do this self-defense move. And I was like, it's not really like, uh, you know, but you know, when you have that, like in like that internal conflict, you're like, Oh, I don't, and you do it. And, you know, and I was just like, nah, I, I want to do my own thing, man. And, you know, Andre and Angelica, like incredible human beings, two of the best people I've met. And, you know, we sat down, had great conversations and we have huge plans for what we want to do. Um, and the actual fact that they had like respect and listened to what I've achieved and, and what I've done and then trusted me with the, the goal of, you know, creating Athos in the UK uh, has, you know, boosted my confidence massively and gave me like a new kind of challenge um, outside of just growing a massive academy. So um it's been very positive all round really 
Yeah, it sounds brilliant, mate. Well done. It sounds like you're doing great things there. Um, talk us through that 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 sort of process with with obviously the the Gavals then, mate. How did you kind of initially yeah. reach out? When did you meet them? And, and talk us through that process. So weirdly, um, this is like a mad story. So I, I competed purple belt world snogi in 2019, I think it was. I was there, um, and I got to the semifinals against a kid called Adam Bradley, who was like a very good guy at the time for them. Uh, I think he's moved now and he's competing on CGI and stuff. So very good competitor, very strong competitor. Um, and Atos have always fielded ridiculously strong competitors and strong teams. Mm. Um, and obviously I was there at Nogi Worlds on my own, um, which I get it when you're traveling that far, you know, not, you know, coach is not always going to be able to go and stuff, but you know, we're an organization of 700 schools and I'm, I'm on, I'm on the mat on my own. Right. So, uh, I got there, I fought against his guy. Um, I managed to beat him. Uh, and I was like super like, you know, excited because you know, they have such a great reputation for being so good. Um, and then I spoke to him after the match. He just congratulated me on like the performance. Um, and I was like, oh, okay, cool. Like, you know, just what coaches do, right? Came back out for the final uh, and he actually sat down at the mat and started coaching me. I thought, fucking hell. And I was like, okay, look, maybe he wants to coach me because I beat his guy and he wants me to be the winner. So it's, you know, looks better for him. Um, but I actually thought like what a crazy situation where somebody's willing to coach me and help me like unconditionally. Um, there's nothing in it for him. He gains no credit if I win or lose or whatever. There's literally zero, you know, uh, motivation to help me and coach me and I actually got DQ'd for going out of the area in a guillotine against uh, Pedro, who was also uh, GB, uh, Mourinho. Um, and he, you know, he put his arm around me, like he was shouting at the referee for me. He was trying to tell him to review it. It's not fair, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, he's put all this investment into somebody who doesn't even really know that well. So we had a good conversation that day. I've always checked in with them. I've always tried to train there when I go over. Um, Obviously, more recently, I've competed against all of their guys, right? I fought Hulk, I fought Kanan, uh, at, like Euros, I fought Hulk at Raw in the O2. Um, and I've always just felt like a stronger like connection in terms of like brotherhood with them. Like weirdly, I'm competing against them and I'm fighting them, but I actually felt more mutual respect and more friendship than I have with people I've shared them at with for the like, last 10 years. Um so I actually flew out, uh, I, I trained there for a week, sat down and had a conversation. I said, listen, I'm going to be completely honest. I'm 28. Um, I feel like competitively I've got so much more uh, I can give and I can do. I have no guidance right now. I, I, I structure my own training. I don't have any head coach. I don't have anyone teaching me. I'm just learning what I can learn and doing what I can do. Uh, and I said, you know, I feel like you guys are the guys that can, you know, take me to a world championship. And I also feel like they're the guys that can... Um, lead me in terms of um mentorship right what they've done with their brand and how they've grew as individuals the like i say the the unconditional support and love that they have for their athletes is second to none right um even the way like angelica is around the academy is like a almost like a mother figure right you can go to her with any problems she put her arms around you she'll coach you advise you and i sat down with her first that was the first meeting i had i sat in a room with her uh, it was like a therapy session i said listen i, I don't feel supported I, I i don't know how to get to a world title like i came so close you know and i'm doing this on zero training with no good training partners i've got a thousand members uh, and you know what do i do business wise and she said to me she goes you got a thousand members i said yeah we're doing really well and she goes man you have all of that and you're not even a black belt world champion. She didn't even mean to offend me. I was, like, <laughs> I was like, no, I'm not. I said, imagine if I was. She goes, we've got like five black belt world champions here and we're just a about... A thousand members? Now. Yeah, just under yeah, now. We have that's just dropped wild, it. That's wild, mate. We're around there, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but like that's, every class, that's mind like 40, 50 people, yeah. Seven days a week now. We, we used to do like five days, but it's impossible because we got like 60 people a class and like the three to uh, three to six year olds class is like 50, 60 every day. Uh, seven to nine is the same. Teenagers, our biggest group is like 80. Um, and then adults, it's normally like 30, 40 a class. Um, yeah, and Nogi. So there's two classes run at the same time. Um, so yeah, it's pretty, pretty wild, pretty good. Uh, we've done well. But like I say, with like zero guidance and um, – I'm not going to say I didn't have help because obviously I did have help. And there's, like I said, there's a lot of commercial and corporate stuff that GB put in place and um, it, you know, it works. Obviously, of course it does, but 
um, I'd never had that like personal touch. Do you know what I mean? And, you know, like if I ring Andre now on FaceTime, like obviously I check they're awake and I just say, listen, this is going on, that's going on. We, we just have a conversation and you know, we have a lot of like respect and love for each other. And um, I think that's so important, man, uh, especially as like a young man, because, you know, I can be honest, you, you can lose your way, right? You can, I never expected to be in this position financially never expected to be in this position you get things that you, you don't know what to do with them you don't know how to manage things you can end up like and i'm not talking in a bad way but even just down to like business like how do i set this aside i need to save money for this i've got to put that away you know this career is not forever i could be injured that could be off like invest it into a house whatever like do you know what i mean i think it's just so important to have somebody around you like that and we we never did we actually had the opposite which was i don't know why um but we were always told that, you know, never really to celebrate our success, never really to talk about numbers, never really to talk about how many members we've got. Uh, and I understand that because I get that it can be crude and I don't talk money. I never say a figure. I will say how many members we've got, but, you know, there's overheads and stuff you got to take out of that. But then I also sat down and I thought, you know, we have, you know, over probably four or 500 kids here that are viewing this potentially as a career. Um, why do we not want to, like make out with successful why do we not want to show them that there's a route why do we not want to be a reference that you can do well in jiu-jitsu do you know what i mean because i think that's so important why does 90 percent of the the kids in school want to be a footballer is it really their passion of football and love for football or is it that they see ronaldo in a ferrari and you know hmm. getting girls and whatever like and that's honest that, that's just true like people are, are attracted to success that's life um, you know, we have Leon here and I've been good friends with Leon for, for years and, you know, he's world champion. He's incredibly successful. He's flying around doing his thing. Like, why wouldn't you want to be that guy? But if you're going around pretending that you're a bum and you're not making that much money to try and make more, I actually think it does the opposite. I don't mean it attracts the right, the right people. I don't mean it attracts more success. Um, and I think that was, a, I think that's a, a poor strategy. And were the Gavals different in that attitude then, were they, mate? Yeah, well, they're just honest. They're the same thing, you know, like they do very well. They're super successful. They live in San Diego in a nice house with a swimming pool. You know what I mean? Like San Diego is not cheap to live in. They have a huge academy. They have, like I said, they have multiple, multiple world champions at every belt, every level. Um, and now we're actually talking to me about their transition now, which is quite interesting, which is, you know, um, a lot of their kind of more established athletes it's like a turnover phase for them now. So, you know, your Josh Hingers, your your Hulks, your, not Kane and Kane and still young enough, but, you know, some of those guys now have been so incredibly successful, had such great careers, and now they're towards the back end. They're now actually looking at their juvenile blue belts, juvenile purple belts, like their daughter Sarah is doing ridiculous. Like, she's incredible. Um, you know, you've got a girl called Lily there, Alex, who's like the juvenile girl. Then you got some of the boys, like they're just doing an incredible job and that's their new generation of like black belt world champions. Uh, and it's such an interesting stage that they're going through because that's kind of like our first cycle of it. Obviously for them, it's probably like their second, third, fourth cycle of it. Um, but I feel like that's in the UK, that's our first cycle of, of actually identifying people that have the potential um, and how you manage them to that success and how you actually manage them to win a world title and you know like i said we've got some incredible people at our academy uh lucy being one of them that's a coach she's won europeans won pans and got silver at world so um at purple bounce she's trained two and a half years so we actually put her up purple too early uh and she had to wait like six months to be eligible to compete oh yeah yeah <laughs> Kind of like the Owen Jones situation. Um, and yeah. then when she went to Purple, she smashed everybody anyway. So there was no problem. So like two and a half, three years, and she's, you know, silver medalist at World at yeah. Purple is uh, insane. So we have a lot of talent here as well. And hopefully with their advice and what they pass on to me, I will just pass that on to the guys and we'll see where we go. Yeah, amazing. And then the, um, I guess, the business side of stuff. So obviously there were some, you know, sort of things with GB that you, you didn't agree with. Atos's yeah. structure to how they sort of franchise or their affiliates, however it works. Like, was that quite yeah. an easy process? Were you quite happy with everything they presented? Yeah, it was, yeah, it was like, obviously it was back and forth. It was a negotiation. Um, mm -hmm. And I think what the, the most important thing was is that, you know, they had faith in me to run this as a region um, and, you know, kind of be the, the head of what their, their expansion here. So they gave me um, essentially exclusive 
uh, deal to occupy the UK. Um, and any other schools that come on board um, would have to go through like a vetting process and a, and a process that's checked through myself and them. Um, you know, there's there's no secret. There's two ways of doing it. You can give everybody a school uh, from Blue Belt onwards, which is a certain method, and maybe that's GB's method and good for them. Uh, and you, you can have 100 schools in the UK tomorrow, but the quality of them will be poor. Uh, and I don't think that's the way of doing it either. Like, this is no disrespect to anybody else in any in any way. Um, but, you know, we've had a lot of people ring here. Oh, hello, are you connected to this branch? Are you connected to this branch? Because we went there and it was a poor experience. There was, you know, the coach wasn't great. He said this, he said that. We didn't like what he did. And I just used to think towards the end of it, I was like, it's actually more of a headache being affiliated to this brand than it is if we wasn't. Um and I think a lot of people do feel that, but it's that comfort zone. And I think so many people are fearful of, can I actually do it alone? Can I do it without these methods in place? Can I do it without that strong brand above the door? Um, and my my advice to anyone would be, yeah, nobody is coming for that logo on the wall. Like nobody's coming for the Atos logo. They're not. They're coming for the environment. They're coming for the coaches. They're coming for how they feel. Um most time they're coming for convenience right if it's 15 minutes down the road that's the academy they're going to choose like that's just <laughs> fact like, that's how it is that you know if you think about how i would choose an academy i'm in the one percent if andre was training to like four hours away i'd be driving there every day training yes but who else is going to do that who's going to do that with kids you know what families are doing that they're not so our strategy has and will be to open them like fully vetted uh the facility has to be something special. The coaching has to be very special. Uh, and that doesn't mean, you, have, you know, there's a prerequisite. You have to be world champion. You have to be, like, really good competitively. Um, you know, look, Dana, he hasn't won anything personally. He's the best coach in the world, or one of. Um, but good coaching, good community, you know, uh, good structure. Obviously, a decent human being um, and a decent membership. Because uh, numbers don't lie, do they? You know, if you've got... A thousand members, you're doing something right, you know what I mean, or you wouldn't have them, or if you, or if you've got eight hundred or five hundred, or you know what I mean. Um, and I know there's gyms with more members than me. I'm sure Stealth do. I'm sure Stealth Manchester's the biggest academy in the world, uh, uh, the world, the UK. That's what I'd heard. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Nobody, nobody wants to talk numbers, do they? But um, I heard they're the biggest one, so that's what I'm going in for. Yeah, mate, you're absolutely right. I think if if the quality's there, mate, you're you retain people and and obviously people coming to jiu jitsu wouldn't have a fucking clue who Atos no. or GB or anybody else. You're absolutely right, no man, I think. And, and, yeah. and quite frankly, they don't care. It, you know, I actually think you win more members over and you'd win more um, members through like your actual safety protocols, your health yeah. and safety, yeah. your DBS checks, all of those things I think are more important than how many IBJJF medals you've won or how many yeah. world titles you've won, honestly. Um, that's just being friendly, you remember, that's, that's the mass market do you know what I mean? Now, if you want an incredible competitive team and you want the respect of your competitors, then yeah, I can't teach you to swim unless I've been in the water. Do you know what I mean? Like, I yeah. feel like you need that credibility to then coach high level guys, no doubt. Um, but you know, you, you're three to six year olds class, uh, world champion or not. I actually feel like a world champion coach is that class way worse than um, a guy that's not because it's a completely different entity. Uh, and a world champion's brain and how you break down jiu-jitsu and coach jiu-jitsu can actually be quite alienating for kids' classes and even beginner classes to a certain degree. Uh, I've had it with seminars where people come and you're a bit like, I get it, but I'm looking at everyone else, I'm like, mm, did they get it? I don't know. You know what I mean? So it's tough. Yeah, 100%. So tell us about the the kind of training approach for, for yourself and Atos, mate, because you obviously mentioned with GB and I think a lot of people know they have like GB1 and 2 and you said about the self-defense yeah. stuff that maybe you weren't keen on. Um, what's yeah. the approach for Atos and yourself like with training students? Yeah, so I just follow very similar to how headquarters are um, and that is, believe it or not, there's a lot of all levels classes. I think personally uh, that's a really good way of running it because – when you have a beginner's class, if everyone's a beginner, it's very hard to set a baseline in the class of where we want to be at. Whereas in an all levels class, like I'm not saying you need to perform to like the black belt in the class level, but you've got somebody to drag you up. You've got you've got a reference. You've got that next guy. You see what they're doing. Yeah. You have an approach. Like um, I think it's all about 
vision if I'm honest and being able to see so when I you know went to Nottingham and was training with Victor etc he's an incredibly talented black belt you had Ollie who was a brilliant uh, purple belt brown belt at the time you had Sean who was a great purple belt above me and I always was trying to play up a level I was always trying to get to their level I was always trying to drill like they drilled practice techniques like that they were practicing um, and I felt like that just threw my level off like through the roof like i I feel like I did it very quickly. I feel like I got to a very good level very fast. Um, but I wouldn't have done that if I was just, and I don't mean this in a rude way, if I was just stuck with the same level blue belts. Because we'd all been doing the dumb shit. We'd have all been doing the same mistakes we'd have, because we didn't, we can't see above that yet. Do you know what I mean? It's like if, you, if you're stuck behind a wall and you can't see over it, but the black belt can see over it and feed back information, I've got a kind of idea what's going on over there, even if I don't see it myself, you know? Um so I think that's very important. Um, obviously, there's there's times where competition sessions, they're going to be more um, advanced, right? If we're working on a certain technique and, you know, we will do that technique for three, four weeks. Like if I feel there's a hole in someone's game or if I feel we're really struggling in half guard positions, we're doing half guard for four weeks until someone gets it right. It's not going to be a theme of the week where we do it for a week and we do a couple of techniques and, you know, how to defend a spin kick and double leg someone, right? We ain't doing that. We're hammering that position because that's what you need. Do you know what I mean? Um, and the same, like all levels class is the same. If we go off, if we go on a topic for two weeks instead of a week, that that's how it is. Like we need to do it. Um, and we did a training camp here before the Birmingham Open. And uh, the response to it and the intensity of training was insane, man. Like we had so many people in like, and I love to see it when it's the people and the guys from after work, man, the guys come in after work and they're getting hammered. Like they're world champions, like <laughs> places and, and going off. I was like, Oh my God, this is wild. It's like some crazy world camp for the Birmingham <laughs> Open. But everyone responded like so well to it and did really well. So we do a lot of all levels, a lot of specific. I I'm a big fan of like specific drilling positions um, and sparring um, because at the end of the day I don't care how well you drill a position if you can't pull it off when someone's trying to stop you point is drilling it at this point you're just doing a, you know a karate form aren't you it's not it's not real and I think that's what everyone loves about jiu-jitsu is how real it is how you can actually do it and control somebody etc so um, you have to be able to do it with resistance you have to be able to do it under stress and pressure um, and Training is pressure testing. Training is that. Uh, I've been to New Wave a few times and I was so fortunate to spend, I've probably spent, you know, six, eight weeks with them guys training with Gordon and Merigali. Like it's on YouTube if you want to watch me get whipped. Um, <laughs> and how they train is that. So like Danaher, for example, will will drill a position and we'll be this, this, this. And it's quite fast. It's not your traditional, we're doing three techniques over the hour. And there's a lot of chit chatting and, talking and you know you drill a little bit you chat about bs and then you check drill a it's like right drill done okay boom next one next one next one next one now we're in specific um and obviously i don't know if it's a secret or not but new wave only do specific training from um mount and turtle they don't do specific training from any other position okay i don't think i realized that it's interesting so i, I have never done specific training at new wave other than turtle and mount uh, and all other positions are covered when you're sparring. There's no need to to do them. I, and I was like, I was in shock. I was like, we're not doing specific. We're not doing specific from side control or close guard. Or I was like, I was lost. I'm like, what the fuck are we doing? Mount. I hate mount. Why are we doing turtle? I hate turtle. <laughs> well, maybe that's the point. <laughs> I actually asked them. I said to them. I said, you know, I said to like Davis and Big Dan, and that. I was like, I was like guys, like, is this legit? You just do these two positions in specific. Said we've been doing that for the last two years. Mount and back is all, uh, is all with them for the last two years. I was like, fucking hell. And then the rounds, um, which is really interesting. There's no timer in the gym. So uh, John, for example, he'll just sit down and he'll go, right, time on. Uh, how he does, it always cracks me up. Um, and you're just going. I have no idea how long's left. I have no idea how long the round's even going to be. Does, he doesn't tell you, you know, before the round, we're doing 20 minutes. He just goes, uh, ADCC rules, time on. Or uh, EBI rules, time on. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, all right. I'm trying to remember the rule sets. But going at it, and, you know, I, I ended up doing like a 40-minute round with Gordon. Um, might as well have retired after. And I was like, well, there we go. That is that. I, and I had no <laughs> idea how to left, which is also, and if you do it for yourselves, obviously, in your own training, it gives a way different response because 
half the time you're looking at the clock and you're conscious of how long's left, so you go, oh, it's three minutes, chill for 30 seconds, I'll press a little bit, I can survive yeah. 30 seconds till the end of the round. Yeah. But you actually don't realise how much you're slowing your progress down when the last minute you just go, you know what, I'll just survive, I'll just see it out, I'll, I'll wait for the next round or, I'll, I'll, you know, whereas you don't know, you have no idea, you could be stuck yeah. on that back next week. So you're gonna, you've got to try and get out. There's no stalling, there's no slowing the game down, there's no waiting for the next round. Like it's a really different approach. And um, obviously I found it hard, very hard at the start and with the level of guys you're going against, it's even fucking harder, isn't it? But um, it was... Say. Interesting, man. Really interesting. And uh, when I came home and did it with the students here, they were like mind blown. They were like, "Man, I don't, I don't know what to do." <laughs> I'm like, "You just got to do jujitsu." But they're like, "Yeah, but I don't know if I can go for that. Like, how long is it going to be? I don't know if I'm going to gas out." And I'm like, "Look, that's that's the game." <laughs> that's it. I think that's really interesting, though, isn't it? Because that does. Because I know what we're like. We do like four, five, six minute rounds, probably max. Yeah. And, I do it myself. I'm only a blue belt, mate. So if I'm if I'm fighting someone who's way better than me, I'm like, right, I've got a minute to survive now. And That's then I just yeah. do more like sloth jujitsu and, and survive. But yeah. like you said, you're fighting Gordon Ryan and you don't know how long that time is going for, mate. What was that like? That must have been mental. That must have been mental uh, fighting him. Yeah, so long. I'll tell you a funny story, actually, because I tell everyone this story with Gordon, which is funny. I did. My, I went there. I've uh, been there a couple of times. I never actually got to, I didn't meet him or go with him. Um, and obviously like, I don't care about saying it. I'm a fan of him. He's, he's an incredible yeah. athlete. You know what I mean? People think because you're a black belt, you can't say you're a fan. Uh, and if yeah, I ever he's fight a goat, him, mate, isn't he? Yeah, if I fight him, I don't care. I'm going to try and fucking do him. But at the same time, I can be a fan <laughs> of somebody. You know what I mean? Um, and listen, I, I'd never got to go with him. He come in one day and I was like, okay, fucking hell, we could, we'll go together. John goes, oh, Tom, Gordon, go together. I was like, oh, here we go, fucking hell. Gone with him. And at the end of the round, I've gone, you know what? I reckon I'm all right. You know, I reckon I could have got him. I reckon, you know, like when you go with somebody and you think, oh, there was a gap there. There was a hot, like, oh, I'm not that far off Gordon Ryan. And I thought, nah, that can't be because I must be. Next day I go into training, fight past cameras are there. Fuck <laughs> me, man. I, whatever happened the day before, he must have been like asleep because this geezer has murdered me for 40 minutes nonstop. And like, I was trying to think like, I could rep, like, I'm like, yeah, I could definitely wrestle with him. Leg locks, he'll beat me, but I could definitely take him down. I'm shooting takedowns on him, nothing. Then he's blast doubling me, boom. Then he got a bit like, <laughs> start, you know, like, you know how a round like escalates, yeah. like you start building up, you start, so we're going and we're going and I'm just trying to survive. And then we get to the edge of the mat in a double leg and then, uh, he just fucking pushes me at the end of the double leg, like almost into like the weight rack. I was like, oh shit, let's go, we're on. And we're going back <laughs> and forth. And then like, then I've just died, I'll be honest. About 20 minutes into that, I've just gone, oh, I'm, I'm done, I am. And he's just sitting in like camping positions where it's like kind of past my guard, but kind of not. And I was like, I was almost just saying like, please pass my guard because me trying to retain the guard is tiring me out that much. I don't want to. So I was actually playing like, instead of playing guard, I was playing bottom side control. That was my game plan. I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was like it's safer for me to stay here than to try and believe I can keep a guard against this guy. But he's incredible crazy, and, man. you know, off the mat as well. Because I know he gets his bad press and stuff and I know he's, you know, he's very political on his Instagrams and whatever. But, you know, off the mat, he's an incredible guy as well. He spent a lot of time with me, you know, went through a few things with me, helped me out, gave me some advice, gave me some tips. Um, you know, even just uh, strategically, like how he plays the game. And um, I definitely feel like I'm not Gordon Ryan, obviously, and I'm not anywhere near that level, but I definitely feel like trying to imitate some of the things that he does um, and how he plays the game has, has raised my game um, massively. I really do. Um, same with Marigali as well. Myself and uh, Marigali got on like really well. Uh, we had like a good time together, a good laugh, and uh, he was pulling me out for rounds left, right and centre and specific training. Maybe put, maybe put a gear on. I was like, Jesus Christ, man, I'm terrible in the gear. And he's uh, made me put a gear on in bottom mount for about an hour. Um, <laughs> it literally, literally was an hour, it was 40 minutes, and uh, Flow Grappling were filming it. So it was like just 10 minutes after 10 minutes after 10 minutes, just mount with him. Like he's got the best mount oh, in Jiu Jitsu. You know what I mean? It was awful. I think I got out once and I swept. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it must be it must be so fun though to be in those situations with those people and we speak to a lot of people who've, who've rode with gordon and they're really they everyone says gordon's like the nicest guy everyone says yeah, that yeah. he's like he's always keen to help 
I will say, and I know obviously I've seen a podcast with um, Livesy on it. Like, I, I don't think anybody beats him at all. I, I don't think, I, I, I think it's impossible for anybody that is currently alive on this planet um, to beat him in jiu-jitsu, honestly. Uh, the only way he could ever lose is if, you know, a freak accident, a freak injury, or if he's really unwell or whatever. And I know he has his problems and, you know, his issues uh, are up and down, but um, I really don't see anybody beating him. And if you actually, if you're honest with yourself and you look at how he's dealt with people like Bashesha and Cyborgs and these multiple, multiple time world champions, how he's dealt with them is like how I would perform with a teen in the teens class. Like it's non-competitive. <laughs> no, but it's really not. It's not competitive. Oh, yeah. So, and it's so, and I also think that's also the problem because who truly on the planet believes they can beat him as well? Because belief is a huge thing. You have to believe you can do it to do it. Um, yeah. mm. And you just look at his past history and you go, I'm struggling to find ways to believe anyone can, let alone myself. You know what I mean? It doesn't mean I won't have a crack at it, and I will. You know what I mean? If he's if he's game, Flo Grappling want to put it on, <laughs> fly me out. I'm ready. But um, it's it's a belief game, isn't it? And it's hard to believe when yeah. you've seen so many other people try and fail. So. Yeah, we, we think we talk about that in Jiu Jitsu all the time when obviously I'm a, I'm a blue belt and then when you roll with a black belt, even before anything happens, you kind of in, you doubt your head is straight away. You're like, oh, he's two places ahead of me or even a brown belt or even a purple belt. You think, fucking hell, like yeah. he's just got more experience. He's going to beat me. He's going to do this. He's going to do that. And you kind it's of beat so yourself because, before you've even fucking yeah, yeah. done anything. I you know, like that. I, I go with people and I'm like, you're so much better than that. I've seen you in rounds with people that are tough, do so much better, but just this piece of like fabric around my waist is making you feel like you it's impossible. So you're not even trying. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Yeah. And obviously there's a, there's a mindset too, which is, you know, something that we speak about um, competitively as a group, which is so many people try not to lose that they don't try to win. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, you know, I've been so guilty of that throughout my career. I'll be completely honest that something I've worked on and I've, you know, I've had sports psychologists and I've, you know, with Andre and people like that, I've spoke to him through it. You know, I've been in positions where, I feel like I don't want to lose. So I've not tried hard enough to win the match. Uh, and I think that's very common. Like when you're talking about fighting between different belt levels, you know, the blue belt's just thinking, okay, it's going to be, you've already conceded that he's going to win. So you're just thinking, well, how do I make it tough or how do I make it harder or how do I survive longer? So you, now you're not even thinking about win. You're not even thinking about offense. You're just thinking about how defensively sound you're going to be against somebody. And then it makes it easier for them you also, doesn't like it? That you've lost. Yeah, you think like that. Yeah, you've it makes lost it easier for them also because you're not doing your, you, you, you yeah, know, yeah. even you're even your that blue belt, your game. Copy. Yeah, yeah. You're just kind of yeah. like conceding side control, and then you're like, oh yeah, well he's going to mount me now, and then you're kind yeah, of like yeah. working from mount not to get subbed. And weirdly, it happened to me when I was training in Nottingham. Like I would train with Ollie and whatever, and he would he would smash me, and you know, obviously he's more skilled than me, so I would my thought process, uh, my thought process was always like you know, he's submitted me five times this round. Let's try and get it down to four, to three, to two, to <laughs> one, to yeah. eventually, you know, he's not submitting me as often and maybe I can catch him. And I've always used that as like a scale against people that I've gone against, like if I'm way less experienced than them. Um, but obviously now the position I'm in, I'm, you know, I'm the more experienced guy mostly. So uh, you don't see it as often, but you know, even if, if I was going to train in a room with people that are competitively more experienced or more experienced black belts and they, you know, I'd be looking at, how can I change the ratio over a long period of time? Do you know what I mean? It's not going to happen yeah. in two or three rounds, but I've been in rooms as a, you know, a lower, lower level guy. I've been getting smashed and I've just tried to get it lower until eventually I'm not getting smashed and then I can go on the offense, but it is tough, man. It's a long process and it does take a while. So, yeah, hundred percent, mate. You said that obviously Gordon gave you a little bit of advice around sort of his game and strategy, and you said that you took some things away. What was like, if you could name one thing, mate, that you took away from that conversation and that training, what would it be? So the number one thing that I took away from his game plan, which is probably quite obvious to a lot of people, but obviously when he explains it to you, it feels different, is that his thought process is that he's going to press and pass the guard at like 50, 60% tops, right? but he's going to make you defend the pass at a hundred, but he's never going to go back to a position further than where he started. So if let's say for example, he starts in half guard, he starts pressing a pass to try and get to side control. He's going to do that at 50%, knowing full well your reaction, because you have to defend that at hundred percent, otherwise he'll just pass you guard. But when you push back, he will never land in a position further back than half guard. So he won't let you, he won't let you push him all the way out to like a guard or an open guard. 
And then each time he just goes forward and back, forward and back, forward and back, <laughs> like a, an inch and inch and inch and inch until eventually, like I said, when I was on the bottom, like I didn't actually want to regard. I was just like, just staying so I control it's better for me because <laughs> this is a pointless effort and I'm tiring myself out trying to keep a guard that I can't keep. Uh, and that was how he was explaining it to me. Like, he, you know, presses, make them defend at 100, but never go further back than where you started. Then press again, take an inch, press again, take an inch, pressure. And by the time he's in a dominant position, um, it's game over. And, you know, it's like that. <laughs> yeah, they're just dead. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. He, says like it's, he says like, you know, like a sustained pressure over a, over a long period of time. Um, and that's how he, he does it. And that's, you know, if we're honest, that's probably why he chooses uh, unlimited submission only matches because mm. it makes the most sense um could somebody beat him over five minutes probably you know he can be a slow starter somebody could score a takedown or an advantage and you know see it out for five minutes potentially um but if you stick him in a room with anybody on the planet in grappling rules and you know first one out is the winner uh nobody exists mate i'll be honest nobody exists to do it <laughs> Like, like even the Mika thing, people talk about Mika because he's an absolute phenom as well, but he's just too small. Um, I know him and the Ritolos have a little bit of beef and, you know, I'm the same team as them, but I find it hard to see a way. I really do. Um, I spoke to Andre about it as well. I'd love to see Andre fight him in his prime. Probably happened mm. a little bit late. That would have been brilliant. But there's so many matches like that I would have liked to see in his prime. Like, um, you know... There's so many guys in there, but Marcelo in his prime. I don't know, man. I don't know. Hunter in his prime. I don't know. But I just feel like yeah. if I'm completely honest, and I know this sounds really harsh, and it's not a knock at the history of jiu-jitsu, but there's no sport in the world and there's no sport on the planet, and I don't think jiu-jitsu falls outside of this where current world champions aren't better than yesterday's world champions. Um, and I think that's exactly the same as in jiu-jitsu, right? And some people really don't like to hear that because they're living off the past and what they've done 10 years ago. Um, you know, there's a lot of guys that are like, yeah, I'm world champion. It's like, yeah, in 2001. And this is no disrespect, but I, I think a 2001 black belt world champion doesn't win purple belt worlds in 2024. And that's honest because the game has evolved. The game is so different. It's just, it's different now. You've got proper athletes, people training full time, people, you know, on strength conditioning plans, science is more advanced. Uh, that's just how I feel. Uh, and, and, and I know some people might agree, some people might like massively disagree with what I've just said. Um, but yesterday's world champions, I don't think beat today's world champions at all. Not across the board. There might be a match specifically where somebody's terrible at leg locks and somebody's really good. Like, <laughs> of course, there's, there's always going to be a, like those those nuances. But I don't think across the board, 2024 world champions would have any problem with anybody in 1990 or 2000. Or even I think it just evolves, doesn't it? Just the sport it evolves. evolves. Yeah. It just moves and, on, and, and, and I think it evolves. And everyone's learning all the time, isn't they? Yeah. The, well, look at the amount of technology. You know what I mean? Me and you now, we can sit down and we can watch Gordon Ryan teach a two-hour seminar. That's never happened yeah. before. That would have been impossible mm. in 1990. It didn't exist. So Bernardo Farias is the problem, right? BJJ Fanatics <laughs> is really the one. Um, you know, you, you it's don't YouTube, have to isn't it? You know, you could just yeah, go YouTube. Yeah, YouTube, same thing. Like, you know, you have so much access to information that if you really want to learn something or you really want to become great at something, you, you can. Uh, obviously, you have to have a local academy to practice it and actually do the physical work, right? You're not going to be Jiu-Jitsu world champion on theory. Um, but we have so much access to information. I think it's, um, like I said, I think it would be difficult for anyone of um, past and previous champions to beat current champions. So you have to sit there and say, Gordon Ryan is the best in the world. And when he retires and there's somebody winning, they are the best and I don't think I don't think you can make comparisons you have your your super fights like Boshesha against Hodja and I get it but I, I don't think that's a fair reflection over the whole of the sport uh, like, like I said in individual cases maybe but as a whole it's so far advanced who um who else at New Wave was like a real problem because Owen said like Big Dan was an absolute monster obviously you got Marigali yeah. and you got a few others who, is there anyone else who stood out for you um, Luke, Luke Griffith, absolute Griffiths, problem. Yeah. yeah, just beat Kane then <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. Beat me at trials, massive. Like I don't even know how he made minus ninety nine to compete against me. This is like one hundred and ten currently. Uh, huge guy. They're all huge. Um, 
but so technical, so dialed in on what he's going to do, what his game is. Like he has such a strong sense of direction in where he wants the match to go, what he wants to do. Um, if he takes you back, you're done. Like his back control and his back attacks are wild. They really are. Like, it has so much control over the body, like with his long legs and stuff. Very similar to like Merogali. Um, yeah, I'd put Luke up there. Uh, I'd put him up there as winning uh, winning ADCC as well. I think he wins it this year. That's wild, isn't it? Yeah, some fucking talent out there, mate. Oh, that's no, for mate. sure. <laughs> Tom, tell us about your own training then, mate. So obviously, of course, you've got jiu-jitsu. I see you in the gym a lot as well, mate. Yeah, yeah, I do my I do my strength and conditioning. L- listen, my strength and conditioning is to help jiu-jitsu, of course. And um, you know, I'm not gonna lie and say that there, there isn't a previous insecurity there from being a fat bastard. You know what I mean? And just being out of shape. <laughs> so, you know, I have to do it. It's part of my discipline and my routine. I do three lifting sessions a week. I do uh, two assault bike sessions, and then all of my jiu-jitsu drilling and technique and rounds on top. Um, when it comes to jiu-jitsu, I have to be very focused on my approach to it because like I say, I've mostly worked with people a little bit less experienced than myself. Uh, I do have great training partners come in. Um, we have a kid that comes over from Portugal now and then to train with us. He was here last week, Moe. Uh, we have um, Mark Hibbs come up, who's, you know, a very good national level and international level uh, black belt, competed against some very tough guys. Uh, he comes up for the Nogi classes. Uh, and I have a lot of MMA guys, which is why I also feel like my Nogi game is probably a little bit more advanced than my Gi game just because the training partners I have at my disposal all for like no gi are a lot stronger and a lot more experienced. Whereas in the gi, there's a lot more beginners and stuff. So mm. it's just the natural course of what, of, of how our academy has gone really. And, you know, like I say, we've, we've had Leon in the area he used to train with us a little bit. And obviously I was helping him out a few years ago. Um, and a lot of those MMA guys stick around and come in for the tough rounds. And uh, that's why I'd say my no gi training is probably a little bit stronger uh, the McGee training right now. Um, but it's just about being disciplined. I have to put myself in bad positions. I have to work on very small, specific, tiny things. You know, I can't, you know, if I come into training and I just train how I want to train, that's just like a feedback loop for your ego. You know, you're going to come in and beat mm-hmm. everybody up or just, you know, go to your favorite stuff. So I, I play a lot on my weaknesses. I do. Um, and last tournament, I actually started playing guard, which I, you know, I don't really play guard. Uh, I normally like to wrestle and pass, but I jumped guard against a guy and started playing from the bottom and I had a better match from the, from my back than I did on top. So um, it just goes to show you that you can, you can work, you can improve with guys that are maybe not as experienced as yourself, but it does take a ridiculous amount of discipline. Like, you know, I write down in the notes on my phone before sessions, like what I want to do, what I want to achieve, check my phone halfway through and I'm like, am I actually doing what I've said? Because it's also so easy in the you know, the, the thrill of training and rounds that you just, you know, you start being like more expansive and go playing <laughs> everywhere and doing this and doing that. And I love that about jujitsu. That, that for me is why I do it. It like it takes my brain off everything else. I'm just doing mad shit. I'm rolling. I'm like, you know, you're sweating, you're dying, you're in mad positions. But if you're trying to improve, you do have to have an idea of what you're trying to achieve that session or, you know, in, in that week or those months prior to a tournament. And, it served me well, honestly. Like, like I say, I've, I've, everybody loses. Of course, I've lost to some fucking great people. I've lost to some terrible people as well. But for the most part, if I'm fit, healthy, uh, trained well, um, mind's in a good place and happy, uh, I have no doubts that I can beat anybody on any given day. Uh, and you know, I put Nogi. I don't think anyone outside of the top five beat me in Nogi. Uh, if I'm fit and healthy, obviously, I had a match. I got injured, broke my leg in it, lost to somebody that was like nowhere near my level, the sour one. Um, but other than that, like I've lost to Roberto Jimenez, world champion, Pedro Marino, world champion, Eric Muniz, world champion. Like I've not lost to anybody that's not of real caliber, Philippe Trovo, world champion. Um, so I know where I'm at, you know what I mean? And uh, mm-hmm. I know where I can be as well with obviously the recent transition and what I'm looking to achieve. I know where I can go and, you know, I, I, I don't doubt in the near future there will be a, a time where I potentially move over to San Diego for a year or a couple of years to, to get that championship in the bag. Um, that's a, a very strong consideration. Um, but obviously, logistically, with family and a partner, you know, it can be tough, but um, that's the sacrifices that we're willing to make to, to do what we need to do, so. Yeah, mate, it sounds sensible. I think as you were talking, I was wondering about, obviously, the training partners for you and... 
yeah, it feels like that's probably a good option for you at some point. Um, but I get it with the family, but there's worse places to live than San Diego, right? Yeah, I agree. But it's just tough in the UK because I feel like the culture is so much different. When I went over to um, San Diego, I went. I actually went to an open mat at Legion, um, which is Keenan's gym. Um, I went over to an open mat there uh, and everyone showed up, like, you know, from every gym, every affiliation. <laughs> I was yeah. like, geez, what's going on, man? This is unheard of in the UK. There was like uh, Hisham yeah. Rida was in there. Some guys from my way were in there. I was like, this is wild. There's 200 people on this map. And everyone <laughs> just talks to everyone. And I'm like, this is why they're so good. Whereas in the UK, for whatever reason, and maybe I'm guilty of it too. I'm not going to say I'm like innocent. You don't want to train with people that you could potentially compete against. You've got that kind of, do I want him to get a read on me? Do I want him to know what I do? Because, you know, you're all bidding for that like top UK guy spot. Everyone wants to be the best in the UK. Everyone wants to be known as, oh, he's tough. He's really good. So I think a lot of people struggle with that, letting that wall down and compete, not competing, training against each other. When you could end up competing against each other, it's tough. Of course it is. Uh, I had a situation with Mark. We've been training together for, for a little bit. Uh, and then, you know, somebody contacted me saying, oh, would you fight Mark? I'm like, well, ask Mark. <laughs> if he <laughs> wants to do it, I'll do it. But we train together like twice a week. Do you know what I mean? Um, and I think that's the problem because the UK is like <clears throat> so small and, you know, we're, we're all kind of close enough to know each other that you don't want to train against each other just in case you get an opportunity to to compete. And, you know, I actually said the same to uh, Livesy. You know, we put on his, um, on his Instagram that he's like, listen, I just want like big fights and big names. He's not like a championship fighter where he's going to have a run in a tournament. He just wants these big freak matches, right? Like your, your Romero's and whatever. <laughs> um, and I said, listen, bro, we'll get some training. And if you want, like, let's, let's train with each other. Let's see how it is. Or if you want to compete, we can compete. Like if you want a freak show match, in my opinion, there's no better match than like, who's the best in Britain. And it's North versus South. We'll do it in the middle, we'll sell out an arena. And I really feel like we would sell out an arena. You know, like I said, people love me or hate me. So I'm either going to have 100 people wanting me to win or 1,000 people hoping <laughs> I lose to post it on Reddit. Uh, and, you know, Owen's going to be there doing his thing. He's got a huge fan base. And I think it's an incredible match. We've both fought at 99. We've both beat similar people, both lost to similar people. You know what I mean? Paul Larry. I'd, I'd watch it, mate. I'd watch it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know what? I'm down. I really am. Um, and listen, I don't know the politics and ins and outs of some of these shows, but, you know, it is tough. No one wants to see their guy get beat, right? Because he's obviously sponsored and by Paul Harris, so they don't want to give him a match that necessarily he could lose because I would say technically, jiu-jitsu-wise, I feel better than him. Uh, I think he has an advantage on the feet and in the wrestling. Oh, I'll, I'll give you a, a wink on that one, maybe. Um, <laughs> but I feel like jiu-jitsu-wise, I'm a, I'm a better all-round complete um, jiu-jitsu player I do feel that um, and that's I'm not taking anything away from him because I think he's incredible what he's done for uh, UK martial arts and his sport and how candid and open he is with his like thoughts and opinions on social media like I really do commend him I think he's a he's a great person and you know yeah he is he's done a lot hasn't he we're not in similar positions but you know he's got a young family a partner he's running an academy I know the challenges I understand the challenges that he faces and I face um, and I have nothing but absolute professional and personal respect for him, I do. Um, and there's not many people I would say that about that I potentially would be interested with a match. So um, I'd love to do it. Uh, I don't know if Paul Harris will see this. Hopefully they will. <laughs> we'll, we'll clip it, mate. Don't you worry. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. Do you know what I mean? And, and I, like I say, it's a battle of Britain. I love it. I love the thing the is with Owen it. as well. The thing is with Owen as well. He just don't give a fuck. He, he you know, he'd, he'd be That's like, he'd saying. be like, and yeah. I, he would just be like, yeah, no worries, mate. I feel I'll like fight in you. a similar position. Like he's just about it. I'm just about it. Let's just have a match yeah. and have a crack. See what happens. <laughs> do you know what I mean? There's, you know, I don't have fear of losing matches. I really don't. Like, I lost that fear a while ago when you lose to people that you, you shouldn't have. So, uh, I think it'd be a great match. I think it'd be a great spectacle. Just, and I wouldn't, I'd want it to be like half an hour, mate. I want to, I want it to be like going. <laughs> you know what I mean? I hate it when it ends early. Give us 30 minute time limit. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, I'd be so that, excited mate. for that match. It'd be wicked. Do it in the pit as well. Do it in the pit. Nowhere to go, mate. Do it in the pit, man. The <laughs> words that in Wigan. I don't know. I'll get a Wigan burger. I'll have a pie on the bread and butter and we'll get going. But but I'm just saying, like, I, I know for sure, like, if it was in the middle of the, the UK, Birmingham, we sell it out up there, he'd sell it out. Uh, it really would. I think it'd be, a, I, I think genuinely, there's some incredible 
athletes in the UK. You've got your Taylors, you've got your Owen Flanagan's, you've got uh, all of these top guys, and they are incredible, genuinely. Uh, I think they're great. And, you know, they go into ADCCs and CGIs. They're clearly world level. Yeah, good, yeah. Um, but I think what myself and Owen can do is different, uh, and that's selling. And I think it would be a great spectacle. I think we'd sell it out. I think it'd be a huge event. And I actually think it could be one of the biggest events in the UK. Uh, and I say that with full confidence in myself because I've seen what, you know, I fought Hulk as a main event at Raw Grappling, relatively unknown, sold the the place out, did like great pay-per-view sales. Uh, same with Gaojo when I was in that eight-man tournament. I definitely won that match, by the way. Uh, and I'd love to get that one back. But I just know that it would be a spectacle and I think it's something that the UK needs. I really do. I think, I think the UK needs like... Not a rivalry, but it needs that like Nicky Rod Gordon, like, and we're not that level, so don't misconstrue what I'm saying. I'm not saying I'm Gordon, he's Nicky, or vice versa, but you need that kind of two top guys. They've got their own gyms, they do their own thing, like yeah. big clash, uh, and I think it'd be be great. And that's not me trying to talk my way into a match. You know what I mean? I'm good. Do you know what I mean? I don't need Polaris's money, clearly, <laughs> but it would be a great match, and those are the things that excite me too. Do you know what though? I think that's what we're bad with. We're, in the UK, we're bad with that. Like an America would happily then go, I want to fight him and don't give a fuck about the thing. But then you like, you feel like in the UK, you justify yourself to be like, oh yeah, I'm not trying to fuck it. Fight, want to fight him and that's it, you know? <laughs> no, I do. Yeah, I do. But like, I'm, I just know that some people can take it like in the wrong yeah. way. Do you know what I mean? And it, it's never meant in the wrong way because, you know, like I said, I have tons of respect for him and I'm, you know, I, I think that goes both ways. Um, and I also appreciate his position. And what I mean by that is he's not looking at going for a world title run. He's not looking at competing in IBJJF and on the circuit to, to win the title. He's just looking at standout matches that could be wild. Uh, it could yeah. wildly disappoint or it could fucking blow the roof off the dome. <laughs> could, you know yeah. what I mean? No, it could, obviously. It can go both yeah. ways. I, I don't doubt it. Um, and I also feel in a weird way that that's not far off my position. You know, I feel like another three, four years, I'll be in this position where I just want super fights and to get paid or to do, you know, mismatches and fun matches. Uh, right now, I still feel very competitive at the high level and I would like to, you know, still have world championship runs and qualify for ADCCs. I'm, you know, I'm only 28. I've got a few years left, but um, I do appreciate his position too. And I, I don't mind jumping in that and fulfilling for him. And, you know, it's also going to raise my profile and, and raise UK grappling because that would have eyes on it. Obviously, if yeah, he's would, involved, yeah. it has eyes anyway. You know, as an attention thing, he's probably the A side, weirdly, which is great. You know what I mean? He's going to bring some eyes to it. Wicked, I'm down. Yeah, mate, sounds great. Do you get much training with Leon these days, mate? Because you've mentioned him a few times. So we did for a while um, before his first Usman fight. After that, we didn't really. I know obviously he has like a lot of different coaches around him. Um, you know, people want to help out. People come in and out of camps. That's a very standard thing. I do see him um, semi-regularly. His son trains with us. His son's in the teens class. Um, we've always trained him from like day one and a lot of his like close friends, their kids train here. So I do see him in and out of the academy, you know, dropping off um, his son and uh, I do see him from time to time. Yeah. Um, training wise, not so much, but you know, I'm hoping that will change. Who knows? Um, and you know, after some of his last matches and stuff like, you know, when you sit down and review it, maybe some more time grappling or some more time with certain bodies and individuals you know i've always i've always put on great training for him here honestly he's always had tough rounds he's always had like you know tough gra grappling matches and myself and him have always grappled really well together do you know what i mean i know i'm a little bit bigger and heavier um when he's towards fight weight um but out of camp we're not miles away um and i don't mind cutting a bit of weight to make it more realistic for him but um yeah I've, like i say i've known him forever you know i messaged him before the fight you know best of skill and stuff and you know, I have so much admiration and respect for him too, what he's done for, you know, Birmingham martial arts and UK martial arts in general. Uh, and obviously the other day was a tough one for him, very tough one to swallow, but mm. it's part and parcel of the game, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? It's so difficult. What can you, it's very hard to, what do you say in that, in that, you know, it's a tough one, you know, everyone's due a bad night and everyone's due a out of body performance like Bilal probably had. Do you know what I mean? they're the two extremes of it. You can have somebody have a real off day uh, and you can have somebody perform to a level that you've never really seen them perform to before. And that's the result. But, you know, 
knowing him how I know him, if he does the right things and he, you know, and which I'm a thousand percent sure he will, uh, he'll have that belt back or he'll go and get a middleweight one if he wants to. Mm. He's got so many options, but also listen, he's not going to retire. And I would never say that to him because he doesn't need to. He's still got years left in him. Um, but what a story and what an inspiration. And, you know, the guy's incredibly successful, changed his life around. Like I said, you know, I was in the gym as a 16 year old, uh, fat white kid in the corner watching him, uh, and training with him, like literally from that long ago, you're talking 12 years ago. And to see his rise and his journey is just, it's mental, you know, and he, he wasn't even the first guy in the UFC. You had Vaughn go first. That was like a, that was huge back in the day when Vaughn Lee got signed to the UFC, um, from the tough, uh, house, um, and then go in and compete in the UFC. It was like mind blowing to have somebody that local and close compete in the UFC. And now I look at it, obviously Leon's the, the title holder or was the title holder. You've got tons of other guys in the UFC that are local, You're like Jake Hadley's people like that, that all live locally. And, uh, it's amazing to see that they're, that's, they're, they're, they're so successful in their craft. Do you know what I mean? And some people take it like, you know, they get like concerned about other people doing well or whatever. And, man i I big them up they're incredible at what they do and uh i wish them nothing but success man and if we can help in any way or they feel like we're in a position to help then of course we're there ready to do it so but it was a a tough one for him but he'll be back he'll be fine yeah so you think on a different night leon beats yeah obviously i read read a few things i did i read a few things that you know he struggled with a little bit of a back injury he was obviously struggling with the time competing at that time of night which i i fully appreciate would be difficult um i also think the the underlying pressure which maybe wasn't identified by uh anybody else was the fact that it was in the uk um and there was a lot more people around a lot more people closer to the scene than usual um and that's no disrespect to them because you have a lot of friends, you have a big entourage. To, you know, the more successful you get, the more people want to be around you. Um, but I do notice a difference personally when I compete and I'm out on my own somewhere. And I notice a difference when I've got all my boys around me or all my friends around me. I'm a little bit less focused naturally at anybody would be. It's not a knock. Um, and, you know, when I see him go out and do his camps in Salt Lake and he's, you know, there with his four coaches in a house in the middle of nowhere, I just think that's, that's a guy that's a machine that nobody can nobody can get near. But I think when you put it in the UK, you've got a lot more media obligations. You've got, you know, other famous people wanting to hang out with you. You've got your own friends hanging out with you. It's like so much to it that people don't see other than just training and competing. And some of those obligations are like, uh, you have to do them. They're not, you can't talk your way out of them. Like the UFC are saying, right, you're on that radio show. That's it, mate. Like you've got to promote the fight and it's tough. It really is. And I think it was a huge event. Um, I think it's just a combination of things. I'm not going to say it was one thing in particular. I think it was, like I say, a lot of things going on. Maybe he had a back injury. Maybe he was tired. Maybe he had too much media to do. Maybe he had too many people around him. And like I said, he's had a an off day and Bilal's had a very on day. Um, I think a rematch he'd win. Um, but I also think it'd be very difficult to rematch Bilal based on their past history and Leon making him wait a little bit for his shot. I think he might try and do <laughs> So it'll be tough. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever trained any MMA or thought about it at all? I did think about it. Um, I really did. I had a I had a moment like a few years ago where I thought I might transition and do it. Um I just can't the difficulty for me is it would take a lot away from what I'm currently doing. Uh, and what I'm currently doing, I am like ridiculously passionate about, like it's my biggest motivating factor. And I sat down and I thought, well, what is my, what are the things that are driving me to want to do MMA? And if I'm honest, it was not necessarily positive things. It's yeah. Okay. I'm going to get a decent paycheck. Maybe. Um, then I was thinking I was going to boost my profile. It's going to build my, and I'm just thinking they're not things that I want to be willing to get kicked in the head for like if I had to do that to live or survive or make it out of the fucking you know then I would do it I have no doubt and you know past history will tell you I'm not afraid to to go if we have to go but (laughs) I'm in a completely different position I'm in a completely different lifestyle uh do I want it better than a kid growing up in like a Brazilian ghetto probably not so why am I doing it do you know what I mean and um 
you know, if, listen, if I was broke tomorrow and everything went wrong, yeah, let's go. I got to go and make some money. I will fight for money, of course. I will do whatever I need to do to feed my kids. But while I'm in a privileged position, I can use my position to impact in a in a completely different way. Um, that's a little bit not going to say selfish. It's a little bit more selfless. I can use what I've done to create more for others um, rather than just you know double down on being a star. I, and it's not something I've ever wanted. I'll be completely honest. Like I actually have this conversation a lot. Like I never wanted to be in a position of like power or responsibility like you know i get judged on everything i do obviously you guys know like you know anything you ever do anything you ever say anything like someone wants to post about it someone wants to make a comment on it someone wants to create a a hype like trail on it and i'm just like it's never anything i wanted to like i never wanted to be that guy like i didn't want everything i've i've ever done to be scrutinized really um but it's the kind of the the other side to the good side of of hunting and chasing success and trying to be successful and build and create something. Uh, unfortunately, you are going to have people that, you know, want to do that, that maybe are a little bit less successful than you. Like, you know, there's a, a weird quote and it, it's a bit cheesy, but you know, you never meet haters that are more successful than you. Um, so most of these guys that are having problems or are making comments or don't like what you have to say, they're normally in a, a position that, you know, they wish they were in yours. So, I get it. Um, but honestly, I have this conversation with my missus. I have it with my team. I have it with my parents. I'm like, listen, I never, ever wanted, I'm not famous, by the way, but I, I would never want to be famous because even just being an academy owner and, you know, a, a load of people knowing you, you're so fearful for like offending somebody or saying something wrong, or especially in this day and age with how people want to have you and then trying to draw links to you being like, a bad person. I'm like, I couldn't imagine being famous, man. I couldn't imagine being like an MMA star. Like, I, I, I wouldn't want to do it. I'll be honest. I wouldn't like, you know what I mean? It's so judgmental. Um, and it doesn't, but it really doesn't bother me. Like I could read comments about me where people say I'm an asshole, I'm horrible and this and that. And I'll smile and laugh. Do you know what I mean? Because, you know, unless you can ring me on my mobile <laughs> and tell me that you're not relevant enough for it to matter to me. Um, but obviously, it's still as a human you think you, you want to change people's opinion don't you but unfortunately you never will <sighs> part and parcel of it you know what i mean people they are what they are i don't, I don't know but you know i think everyone gets their fair share of you know uh i'm not gonna say haters because it kind of like gives them a name and i think they probably get a little <laughs> buzz up uh i get it i do i actually get it because you know i'm a young guy i've done relatively well uh, and I appreciate that some people will either gravitate towards it and want to learn from it or be involved in it or do something similar or sit there and point fingers and say, oh, it's because of this, it's because of that, you know. And I'll be completely honest. I can be open and honest with you guys. I used to be that person. When I was unhappy, when I was overweight, when I wasn't doing what I wanted to do in life, when I wasn't fulfilling my purpose, I was that guy. And, you know, like I said, I lived on a council estate and where – I'm looking now where I'm where I currently am is that incredible area and I used to go oh yeah but they've only got that because their mom and dad's got money they've only got that because I've been that person and I know what it is uh and it's not them it's you it's something in you that you feel like you need to make an excuse for why somebody's doing better than you but you just don't just like enjoy it like be inspired by it like I, my mentality's changed so much like if I see someone driving here now in like a bad boy lambo I'm not going, oh, I bet, I bet his mom bought it or oh, I bet he's got like inheritance money to get that. I'm like, I just say, bro, what are you doing to get that, man? Because I want one. Like, that's sick. <laughs> so, and then they say, oh, I'm doing this. I'm, not, like, I'm so happy for you. That's amazing. I could never do that. But I'm happy that you can. I may, like, you know, I'm not going to be a brain surgeon. But I'm not going to hate on one because I might need one one day. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And I, I feel like once you get past that, you become such a different person it's like it's unreal and i think my own parents and my own family have become that because you know we've you know grew up with nothing uh, and my parents are very successful now and you know i'm doing okay my sister's doing you know she's really successful so uh i think you just i think you have a different vibe when you grow up differently do you know what i mean if i'd always been successful i probably wouldn't a appreciate it and b i wouldn't understand the other side but i do understand the other side and i have been the kid that wants to make an excuse for why everyone else is doing better rather than just look in the mirror and go, right, what can I actually do? Do you know what I mean? 
Um, so I feel sorry for them guys. I do. I feel sorry for them guys on Reddit. I feel sorry for anyone that wants to write it down. I really do. <laughs> yeah. I just don't know where they get the fucking time. Do you know what I mean? I just don't know where they get the time. Everyone's had, everyone's had a sly little comment about some at some point. Of course we have. We all have. We're human. But to go and express it online behind an unknown profile is fucking wild, man. Because <laughs> if I want to say something sly, I'll just say it. Do you know what I mean? If I, I, that's who I am where I'll just put it on my own story. Let it be known that I said it. But to do it anonymously. Wow. I don't know, man. I don't know what that is. Uh, mate, there's some odd people in the world, mate. That's it. <laughs> yeah, there's some wild people, I don't mate. even know you make an account on there. I might make one. I might start talking about <laughs> Mate, do you think um, some of your change in mindset, obviously your success will definitely attribute to it as well. But do you think some of it is working with like, the American guys, like all the Brazilians, like the Gavals? Because I think when people are really like they just slag people off and they they've got this like bad mindset it feels like a very british thing sometimes and when we spoke to americans they've been mega positive listen, it is so british it's untrue like and listen I, I will tell you an honest story i'm guilty of it with the fucking english national team when i watch them play football i'm going jesus guys what are they doing why have we got gareth southgate is shit we need to get pep guardiola whatever I'm that guy. And I sat down, I was like, yo, I'm being that, I'm being that person. Like, he's not the worst manager. He's actually the most successful English manager of all time. So why am I calling yeah, him he shit? Actually is, yeah. What am I basing that on? Do you know what I mean? And yeah. it's again, I think it's when we look at things uh opinion based and subjectively, right? What something means to you means something differently to me, means something differently to my dad, right? But if we sit down and we actually look at facts. That's where the truth lies. And when you actually look at facts, then you can make informed decisions. And I think that's the difference. I think in the UK, we are so emotional uh, and we're so pent up with, you know, you know, a lot of people maybe are in like, um, they don't like what they're doing or working or whatever. And we're so emotional that we need this crazy release. Uh, and it could be a news headline. It could be something crazy like what's happened in the last few days. Uh, it could be a football match. Like I, I've been to football matches and I sit there and I go, how on earth are 40,000 men here just like going <laughs> off their head, drinking, shouting, screaming, crying, like shouting at a professional footballer, another human, like, oh, I could do better than that. And I'm like, how is it that we can do that, but we can't create change for ourselves and we can't, you know, create a, a better life for ourselves when we can spend that much time, emotional effort uh, and passion. And that's what it is. They're, they're so passionate. Like, why can't you use that passion in such a positive way to like, listen, I'm not going to be some like hippie and change the world, but you can definitely change your own. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm not mm. sitting here saying I can change the UK. I fucking can't. There's no way, but I can change my own reality. I can change how I uh, see things. And listen, Americans are probably too far the other way for me. Uh, when I go there, I, like after about a week, I'm like, man, they're like overly positive. Like it's, it becomes draining the other way because I like, I can't stop smiling. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, oh, I, get a rest <laughs> of the day. I mean, I'm going to try to buy a coffee and you know, they're all over you. Um, Brazilians a little bit like that, I guess. Um, but I think that's more of their American influence. Um, but I think like, I'm so fortunate that I've traveled, I've seen different cultures, I've seen different ideas. I've had great references in my life. I've had great role models, um, you know, and I'll be honest, I've had like great women, like my my mom and my nan, like they were always like, not raised me because obviously my dad was working a lot, but I've always been around them a little bit more. Um, and I've always had a more positive outlook and I've always had a more positive energy. Um, I think it's UK men and a certain age of men. Uh, and I don't know if it's kind of heightened by um unrealistic expectations of what we should achieve and where we should be um because you know not everyone's going to be driving lambos and andrew tate we're not like it doesn't exist you know what i mean we're not all go we're not all going to be that guy um but is that more alpha male or is that more attractive or is that better than you know a guy that goes to work and works hard and looks after his kids and puts a roof over their head because you're more of a man than any man if you can, you know, raise kids and look after the kids and look after a woman and a, and a household. Like that to me is the ultimate alpha male. So I think there's a generation of kids that are, that have grew up on the internet, grew up with a lot of unrealistic and unfair for them expectation. If I'm honest, it's unfair because you see your Jake Pauls, you see your Andrew Tates and, you know, realistically it looks like they're not doing a lot and they've got a lot, 
Um, but it took an incredible amount of hard work for them guys to do what they've done. And it was a different path. Um, you know, we maybe don't have access to those paths yet. Uh, of course, we all have YouTube and, you know, you've got the sidemen and people like that that are, you know, pretty huge. But for your average guy in the UK, like that's not a realistic lifestyle. That's not a realistic expectation. And I think what I've seen, and I've seen it through jiu-jitsu, and jiu-jitsu, in my opinion, is kind of like a micro uh, example of life. If you set realistic expectation, you're so much happier. And if you set goals that you can achieve, and that doesn't mean you shouldn't set goals that don't take a lot of work to achieve, but they are achievable, even if that's over a 10, 20 year period, you're such a, a happier person and a, and a more um, leveled person. But you know, if I set a goal tomorrow that I'm going to buy a private jet by the end of the year, I, I'm never going to fulfill that. It's impossible. And I'm just going to be unhappy and disappointed. Do you know what I mean? And like I said, I've seen it in jiu-jitsu. I have people coming here to go, Tom, I'm going to be world champion. I'm going to be the best in the world. And I'm like, you're probably not though. So then what? But they come in with that expectation. They train like a world champion for the first three months. They're giving it all the beans, three sessions a week. They're buying all the gear. That, that, like, and by the way, I mean rash guards because I know what them ready boys are like. They're, buying all the gear. <laughs> they're doing all their bits and bobs, right? And then they lose at a local comp. They go, man, that's reality's just hit. Boom. Can I actually be world champion? And they just fucking nosedive into the ground, never to be seen. They're not training. And it was all just from unrealistic expectation you know what i mean and i've done it myself i've set goals and i'm like it's really not realistic so there's long-term goals that you should set that should be very hard to achieve and you know on the air of almost impossible um but i think when you set these crazy unrealistic goals like i have you know i teach a lot of teens here you know what i mean and there's a lot of teen kids and they're just the the way they think and that is wild like they think it is all lambos and yachts in miami and it's just not real. It's a, it's an Instagram, TikTok world. It does not exist. And um, I think if people were happier with reality, uh, we would have far less problems, if I'm honest. Uh, and you'd have a, a lot of happier generation. Yeah, I agree, man. And I think there's nothing wrong with aspirations, but I think you're right. I think goals need to be achievable, 100%. Yeah, a thousand men. I have loads of aspirations, loads. But, like, you know, they're there to motivate me. They're there to drive me. Yeah. They're not they're not um, kind of things that I get to. And if I haven't done it, I have no self-worth over, you know, because I think that happens to people that go, you know, when, I, when I'm 25, I'm going to have like a house, two kids, a nice car. But like, if you don't, then don't let that be like an error. Don't let that be something that's a negative. Let that be like, oh, okay, I've, I've readjusted my expectation. That's a goal for 28. That's a goal for 30. Um but so many people just head loss when they don't hit what they think they should have. And it's a shame. It's, it, it is tough. And, uh, you know, like I said, I've been there. I've had a few of those things, obviously, mainly in my competitive career in jiu-jitsu, right? I, I assumed I would be a world champion at, you know, colored belts. And, okay, I've medaled and I've got silver and I've lost, you know, a few finals. But, you know, it still hurts. But, you know, I just say, well, okay, now it's by 30. Now it's by 33. I would just push it back and keep working. Uh, and if it never happens, then who I've become in the process is probably more important. Yeah, 100%. Mate. That's segue into your goals and aspirations then, mate. So thinking about maybe the next five years, so you're 28 now, so maybe by like 33-ish. So so what, what do you think you can achieve in the next five years and, and what would be like an aspiration to achieve in the next five years or even 10 years? Yeah, I think in the next five years, like competitively, I think, you know, I, I do want to achieve a, a world title. Um in Nogi for sure, whether that's IBJJF or ADCC. Um, obviously, you'd assume IBJJF is probably the easier route now with you know how uh, big ADCC has got and the qualifying process. But um, it's not to say it's not difficult, and I think that would just be the kind of the 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 cherry on top of the cake for me, if I'm honest, of what I've, of what I've wanted to achieve. I've always wanted to be uh, the best in the world, even though it only lasts for an hour. Um, but I think that would just mean a lot to me personally. And, I, you know, I've put a lot of personal sacrifice into what I do that maybe people don't see. Um, and obviously that sacrifice does have its rewards in terms of, you know, financially and, you know, the lifestyle I live. But if I'm honest, there's always that part in your heart where nothing can really replace that title, whether, you know, it doesn't matter how successful you are off the mat. 
I think, you know, that's a, it's always been a huge goal of mine. I've always had that goal with my, my family that I set, um, you know, with a lot of special people that mean a lot to me and I would love to be able to get it done. So in the next five years, I, I, I would say that's my main goal is to be world champion and, um, like I'm realistic as well. I, I can't see that necessarily happening in the gi uh, with the, you know, training partners I have and the level that I, I'm at. You know, if I went and spent two, three years in San Diego in the gi, maybe, why not? Uh, you know, I have that confidence and belief in myself, but if I'm to be realistic, I think it'd be more likely to be in the no gi um, side of things. Um, and then obviously business-wise, just keep growing and doing what we're doing. You know, we've been successful. We've brought a lot of people on. We've brought a lot of coaches in here. We have, you know, three, four coaches now that are paid uh, that, you know, have quit their jobs and moved their careers over to what we're doing. Um, obviously, we've got some great expansion plans for our own academies as well as, you know, bringing affiliates on board that, you know, want to go on that journey with us. And, yeah, aspiration-wise, uh, I'm going to live on the road that I used to drive down when I got kicked out of school. That's the... That's the game plan. And, uh, you know, I'm not miles away from it. I, you know, I, I sat down with my, my partner the other day and obviously we've just built a house um, pretty much from scratch. Uh, and obviously we can either live in it or we can do it again. But if we, you know, if we go again or do one or two more, uh, I'm on that road that, you know, I promise myself and that we want to be at. So uh, we're in a bit of a dilemma right now. But sh she's very understanding, like, you know, she's very intelligent, switched on, so she understands the game. Um, but yeah, I think that uh, that's my aspiration, do you know what I mean? And silly as it is, it's motivated me throughout my whole life, you know, to get out of where I grew up and be in a nice place, nice area. Um, mainly for my kids, that was a huge um, motivation for me. Um, and that's probably my final aspirations and my final goals is to see them happy and see them successful. Um you know, I had a good upbringing. It wasn't, it wasn't terrible, obviously like on a personal side, like with my parents, we had always had a great relationship, but we didn't necessarily have everything we wanted and we didn't always live in the best places and have the best times. But, um, I feel like so privileged that I can give that to my kids and, uh, it's like a management of how we do that correctly as well, because, uh, you know, uh, you can spoil people. You can kind of, take that edge off them that I don't want to take off them. They're too like two little bruisers, man. They're like, they're scrapping all the time. They're, <laughs> man, they're like units. I love them. I really do. Like they're, they're, they're amazing. But how do we not take that edge off them whilst raising them in like a crazy fucking world? And that's another consideration as well is, is where, where we end up actually living and settling down because, um, obviously there's loads of talk about it on social medias and medias now with how the, the UK is and, it's tough, man. I feel like I live in the best place on earth. Like I love here. I really do. Like it's in my heart, like Sutton Coalfield, this area and the surrounding areas in my heart, man. I, I don't want to be anywhere else. But when I see things on the news that I see, when I see local stories of kids being robbed for a fucking North Face jacket or an iPhone at knife point and stuff, I just think, man, what is the, what is the point? Do you know what I mean? What is the point working hard to put my kids in danger? So I don't know. I like Dubai. I like the heat. Texas, mate. Texas. Texas for me, I think. Nice, yeah. Texas would be cool. Um, San Diego is really nice. San Diego is like quite, um, uh, like quite a Republican place in California, if that makes sense. And I'm not politically like either way. I'm just saying like it's quite, it's not too liberal because I've been to LA. I've been to, you know, some of the north parts of California and they are quite open and a little bit too liberal for me. Uh, and, I, and I mean that in the nicest way, like, you know, I'm all for everyone being whoever they want to be. Uh, you do you, as long as it doesn't affect me. Um, but anything, anytime something's pushed, like an agenda's pushed onto me or my kids, or uh, then obviously it gets you back up a bit. So um, there's some areas I'd have to avoid for sure. I wouldn't want to throw it up in Hollywood anyway. I know that, Jesus Christ. Um, but yeah, there's some nice areas in the world there is. Um, so we'll see. I can't see myself ever moving. I'll be honest. I'm, I don't know if I'll be able to pull the trigger on that one. But with the with the current uh, lie of the land, it is a it is a scary time, isn't it? In the yeah, in the it's a consideration, mate. It's a consideration. But no, mate, it's it's all good. I think. Um, Tom, I think we have covered tons there, mate. Thank you. Is there anything you want to kind of finish up with? Anything you want to say to people listening, or anything else you want to cover? Um, 
I think I think one of the biggest things and one of the biggest considerations is just like communication. You know, I think sometimes when I'm in a position I'm in or, you know, uh, you know, obviously as a professional, as a competitor, I'm quite um, aggressive. I'm quite switched on um, and I want to win and I want to be the best in the world, right? And I think that's, I think that personality sometimes gets misconstrued that that's how I am day to day or that's who, you know, Tom is. And uh, I couldn't be further away from that if I'm completely honest. And, you know, uh, how I compete and how I relay myself in the public eye is a completely different person to who I actually am. Uh, and I think sometimes that's a difficulty that a lot of people have and we all have when we look, watch athletes or if, you know, if I watch a footballer, I get a certain impression of somebody and I make that impression based on a on-field or on-map performance. Um, I just feel there's, like there's, there's a lot more to individuals than what meets the surface and and I'm guilty of that, right? I'll be completely honest. I wasn't like a huge Gordon Ryan fan until like I met him. You know, fucking a bit of a dick, or you know, he's saying he's going to armbar the guy, then armbars him. I thought, you know what I mean? You can get it's a bit cringe, isn't it? You're a bit like, oh god, like did he need to? Like it's a bit, you no, know, taking the piss. But when I actually get to know the guy and understand why, you know, we all play a character. We all have to get enrolled. You know, we all wear many hats in life, right? Like you know, uh, right now I'm me on a podcast. Now I'm going to go put my hat on and be dad and spend Sunday afternoon with the kids and food and whatever and partner. And when I come in work on Monday, I put my business hat on. When I'm coaching, it's like, you know, my coach's hat. Like, we all wear different hats and masks to uh, play certain occasions. And um, I think it's important that people look beyond just the, the the most obvious ones. And it's something I've been guilty of, which is why I say it, because I've, I've judged a lot of people in my life based on, you know, seeing them do or be or act however they are. Um, but when I've actually got to know them or I've had a conversation, I've been pleasantly surprised. So um, I think it's a cultural thing. We all do it. Um, and we, everyone loves a villain. And if uh, if it gets me paid and I need to be everyone's villain, I will. Um, <laughs> but, you know, um, there's more to it. You know what I mean? And um, that's all I would say to people, you know, there's a, there's a lot of emotional people within the jiu-jitsu community. There's a lot of people that are like tied hard and tarnished to like a brand or, you know, like if you've got a GB logo tattooed on your chest in a rip, in a rip chest fucking style, like you know, I can't talk to you in any way that would ever change your mind than I've left and I'm the biggest dickhead in the world and rah, 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 like, okay, you know, but I'm not talking to them. I'm talking to the average people. Like there's so much more than meets the eye. And I think you have to do a lot more in-depth research and just sometimes what, you initially see, do you know what I mean? And, you know, we've made this decision to rebrand and, and I've made certain decisions in my life to impact myself positively, but also my coaching staff and also, you know, the guys that work here at the academy. Um, and we wouldn't take those decisions lightly. And, you know, the same as another 33 academies leaving, they didn't take those decisions lightly. So I think sometimes is um, something that I learned for myself is to take information, process information, and then speak on the information, you know, uh, I, up until the, probably yesterday, I'm the most hot headed person you'll meet. Do you know what I mean? I am, uh, it's just in my blood. It's in my nature. It's how I grew up. You know what I mean? Somebody says to me, what the fuck, what, like, what does that mean? Do you know what I mean? And, uh, I, I have learned that over a period of time, you have to just, you know, think on it and then act. Uh, and it's definitely something that I've massively improved that. And it's definitely something that I needed to improve that, uh, business wise, um, you know, if somebody comes in with a problem now, I can't just go, ah, oh, what the fuck's going on? Like, ah, oh, head loss. I have to process that information and speak on it. And I would just, I would actually urge everyone to do that because we make decisions and so flippantly and quickly, and then it sticks. And then we're just like, that's it. You know what I mean? I could go, ah, oh, Paul is a bit of a knobby, is, you know, and then that's, it's in my brain now. But, and I'll always think that, well, no, <laughs> just mean, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I got it right. But unless he goes beyond that to, you know, kind of reverse it i would never know and unfortunately when you're in the public eye I'm not a public figure like i hate saying that but like when you're in the public eye or you have people watch you from afar they'll make those um kind of decisions and there's never a chance like i can't there's never a conversation to be had it isn't like i can and i never would be able to explain to everybody why i've made certain decisions but um i think you have to look beneath the surface you know what i mean and especially with what you know, rebranding and moving brands, it was a huge decision. And like I say, there was no financial incentive for us to do it. 
you know, we, we have to put in a whole new infrastructure of getting geese here from uh, Pakistan, from Kings Direct and from the US. And there's been so much headache uh, of doing it, but it's been absolutely worthwhile because we're just in a completely different state to, to where we were, again, in a comfort zone with a brand that, you know, our values don't align anymore. And at some point they did, and now they don't. And people get tarnished with that so heavily, man. Like, it's such a big thing. Like, oh, you've moved away or you've changed or you've done this. But like, you know, <laughs> how, like, let's let's be honest and let's be realistic. How many people are still with their first missus or still with their same first partner? Because things grow apart, things change. People have different ideas. People have different, you know, uh, morals and that's life, you know. But I think people get so punished by changing in this community like team or uh, ideas <laughs> it's, it's wildly controlling mate jiu-jitsu on. as a community is just fucking unforgiving i think and i think people get so set in their ways set with a certain coach or a brand and it i really don't care yeah i don't care and like you know i'm loyal as anyone i really am i'm loyal as anyone when it comes to you know my coach i would never anyone everyone say a bad word about them uh, you know, there's people that have done me wrong within that previous organization and you'll never hear me personally say a bad word against them you know some of them have been like father figures to me they've helped raise me they've helped give me everything that I've got right now and I would never bite that hand that helped feed me uh, I wouldn't but you also have to allow people in life to change to make decisions to train where they want to train to do what they want to do and let them, you know, if you feel like they're making a bad decision, like let them find out, you know, I've had plenty of people here that I feel have made bad decisions or, you know, and they found out they're in a worse position than they've been. Their training's gone downhill. They hardly train because they've moved to somewhere further away. And they end up feeling like they've burnt the bridge uh, to come back. And that's never been from my side. I've never, I would never burn the bridge. My doors are open to everyone, even if you hate me, uh, come and train. Because, uh, you know, I think you change your mind after a strangle, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. That's, that's good, mate. It's true. It's, true, it's true, though, mate. I, I've, I've been sort of in and out of jiu-jitsu for like 15 years, mate. So I'm kind of used to the politics and the bullshit. But Danny yeah. kind of came in like, I don't know, two years ago. You're like, what, 32? 32, 32 yeah, years 32, old? Yeah. And he was just like, mate, what the fuck is all this about? Like, It fucking blew my mind, mate. Honestly, I was like, it's so strange, men acting like five-year-olds, mate. And I just, from the outside in, is, I can't understand I was it. In on it. I was in on it. I was that person because like, I've been brought up in this culture. Do you know what I mean? I was been brought up in this way yeah. of like, you know, your students shouldn't train elsewhere. That's crazy. You shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't train elsewhere. It's like you creance, isn't it? What it's you, yeah, you can't go anywhere unless you wear this gi. And I'm like, I, unfortunately, I was very impressionable. I'm an 18, 19 year old kid, like coming up through the ranks. And like, I've listened to it and I've took it as gospel. And then, you know, I've sat back and I've, I've just kind of thought to myself, this is mental. Like, if you acted <laughs> this way, you know, but if you act that way in any other arena, in terms yeah. of life, you're a control freak. Like, you can't do that with your missus. Like, oh, no, you can't go out without, you can't go out unless you wear a t shirt with my face on, because I want everyone to know that you're <laughs> in case somebody else tries to take you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really odd, mate. It's really odd. It is really odd. The culture of it. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an unnecessary insecurity, because, like I said, 99% of your membership base. Uh, and I will give this advice to everybody. Like, if you want, if you wish to take it from me, ninety-nine percent of your base are interested in the community. They're interested in the facility. They're interested on in the convenience, how close you are, right? And the other one percent that will travel two hours to train with a guy that will go to the place because it's got tougher rounds, or or will, like they're the one percent, and you can't cater to them. And I've always said it, like, you know, 99% of our members are here for convenience. They love it. They love the people. They love the coaches. They love the environment. It's on the doorstep. Like, it's a good gym. The facilities are clean. The coaches are clean. You know, the staff are, are happy. And, you know, that's why they're here. Uh, and I, I could replace myself today with John Danaher, and we'd probably have less members. And that's not because I'm better than him at all in any sense it's because of the community that we bring and because we're relatable and we're honest people from this area. You know, people look at me as a kid that went to school two minutes down the road that's now successful through jiu-jitsu and they bring their kids here 
to try and replicate or do something similar. Or even if that's not on their mind, just to enjoy what we've built and what we've created. Uh, and I think so many school owners and so many people are insecure about people going somewhere else better than them. That again, it's that same theory. You're trying not to lose rather than trying to win. So you're trying to hold everybody in so they don't go away from you rather than just being more you and creating more by being better. Do you know what I mean? And I've always said, I'll just, I, I personally feel like I can outgrow any amount of loss of members. Like if 500 members seeing this podcast now, I went, Jesus Christ, got a bit too much money. Any about, they go on their calculator, 1,000 <laughs> times, 99. Uh, okay, yeah, that's why. Uh, right? Then they, they left. I would outgrow it by being more me, not by going to the other 500. Whoa, guys, you can't go anywhere. Like you better stay here forever. Like it's, it's about being open, not closed. Uh, and I think that's, I don't know where that culture and insecurity came from but it is rife throughout jiu-jitsu. It really is. It's terrible. It's interesting you said about the young lads as well, where you were impressed about 18, 19. And I feel like in jiu-jitsu, they get affiliated with their coaches and they, at yeah. a certain age, they they follow every single word they're saying. And I, me being a little bit older, I think by the time you're 25, 26, you're going to look back and realize that this fucking bloke's full of shit. Basically, yeah. And I, I, I'll be honest, like, like I've said, I was that kid. Do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm going away to world championships. I'm traveling with these guys. You know, I'm not going to I mean this in like not a crazy way, but you're almost brainwashed to believe a certain thing. And I'll tell you, I would have like died for my coach and my teammates. Like I was like a, you almost become like a militant soldier. And then I look at it and I'm going, <laughs> what the, why have we got this amount of loyalty to somebody that has zero back? Because if I'm honest, I was just a paying member. And I say to people, I'm honest with them. I say, listen, we can have a super personal relationship if you want. We can be friends. We can go out to dinner outside of the academy. We can do all those things if you want. But we can also just have a business relationship where you enjoy classes and you enjoy this place and it costs you this much. Thank you. Like that's our value exchange. I give you great classes and a great facility. and You give me 60 pounds in return. Like that's also an okay relationship. That's how most relationships and life work, right? If, you know, if I love going out for a meal at my local uh, pizza place. They always do a great pizza. It's 20 pound. That's the value exchange. Perfect. I don't need to love the guy and know the guy and never try a different pizza and never go anywhere else. And, and wear pizza tops everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? I've got to wear Domino's. Like I say that, I'm going to have to stop <laughs> But I've got to wear dominoes. You know what I mean? <laughs> Do you know what I mean, though? It's, it it yeah. is that. And um, listen, like I said, I, I don't know where that culture comes from. I was definitely a part of that culture. I've definitely had that ingrained into me for sure. It was definitely a part of my, my personality and character in the past. Uh, a million percent it was. Um, which is why I also put open mats on now at the academy, especially after being to Legion, uh, what I was telling you earlier. It's open to all affiliations. There's no uniform requirements. So you're not, you know, having to buy a rash card to come here or anything like that. It's open to everybody on a Friday, Saturday and Sunday to come and train because I just said, like, I want to build community. I want to, want to build something special. I don't, you know, okay, you're not paying me for one session. I'm not really coaching it that much. You know, if you come in every day of the week, okay, there's going to be a value exchange of payment, but I sit there and I go a couple of sessions over the weekend, get as many people in, mingling, chit-chatting, cross-training. You know, I've met so many friends through this. I've met so, so many incredible people through this. Why wouldn't I want other people to do the same? Um, so use the facility, use the academy. We have these teenagers coming every Friday now. Like Friday night is like fight club, man. They they just, I think they're in like some schools group chat and all the other kids that train at all the other schools, they just invite them in and they're just like having it off. <laughs> and I was sitting, I was like, this is actually incredible, man. I, I, I sat there the other day watching. I was like, this is fucking brilliant because what a, what a situation. Like, I wish I had that when I was in school. You know what I mean? You can be, meet up with all the other yeah. kids from all the other schools, just like training together and stuff. And like I say, no bullshit, no politics. I'm not trying to sell them nothing. I'm not, when they're leaving, oh, we're the best school. Come here, come here. Fuck your school. I'm like, yeah, cool. I'll see you next Friday. You know what I mean? And eventually they all go, Tom's so laid back and chilled out. This geezer's telling me I can't go over there and do open mat because he don't like me training there. They know the problem is. It's not me. Uh, and they end up pushing people away more than they bring them in. You know what I mean? Yeah. I use this analogy a lot and it, and it cracks people up, but it's like me being with my missus now, 
and right, I was I could say to my missus as a joke, yeah, she will crack up when she watches this. I could say to her, I say, go out, yeah, find anyone you want better than me. That's how like secure I am in myself. But these school owners are like must lock their missus in the house in case they bump into somebody <laughs> better than them that are not wearing a fucking GB t shirt. Because I, I don't know how to get through the day. Because there's so much competition in life. How can you be worried about one member out of a thousand joining another school when there's so many more things that are competitive in life? You know what I mean? I'd be worried about what's going on in your house. (laughs) 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 How mad? Yeah, it's it's so true, mate. But, you know, that's the game. Yeah, mate, listen, it's been really fun chatting, man, and you're obviously doing great things, buddy. So, so yeah, keep doing what you're doing, mate. I love your attitude. Appreciate it, man. We're going to keep growing. Yeah, good man. We're going to come down and train as well, for sure. I will come down. Yeah, yeah, we'd love it. Yeah, we'd love you to have you down, mate. We'll we'll sort it out. Yeah, Yeah, so we can get you in the studio on this occasion, mate. But yeah, next time, next time we'll we'll be in person, mate. That'd be good. And I'll uh, I'll do it in the dark room. It looks better. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, (laughs) awesome, buddy. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Sound.